Welcome back to my series on chess opening theory. In this video, I'm going to be talking about the King's Indian Attack repertoire and how to deal with the move on to f5 on move 1. In other words, when we play knight to f3, how to deal with the Dutch defense. Now, an important thing to note is that this video the opening that we're going to talk about today, it works well against move 1, pawn to f5, but if our opponent instead tries something like pawn to e6 or pawn to d6 on move 1, you know, playing pawn to f5 later, then this isn't going to work. But the moves 1, e6 and 1, d6, those will be covered in a later video. So, against the move pawn to f5, what we're going to do is we're going to play the move pawn to d3 and play for an immediate pawn to e4. This line is called the Delayed Lizardson Gambit, and it is very, very dangerous. Why is it called the Delayed Lizardson Gambit? Because the regular Lizardson Gambit is when we now play pawn to e4 immediately. The problem with this line is that while it does have some tricks in it, the refutation for it is actually pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple for black to know. Like basically, black will just accept the pawn. We play here, getting ready to get very nasty with some stuff over here. Black to play knight to uh, f6. And then after pawn to d3, e black will not take the pawn. Taking the pawn will be very dangerous, of course. Black just plays pawn to e5, giving back the pawn, and black will equalize. So this is the regular Lizardson Gambit, and unfortunately, it's not that good. Like, it's okay, but we can do better. What we're going to do instead is we're going to play the delayed Lizardson Gambit, because we want black to be taking this pawn on d3. So instead, after knight to f3, on to f5, we play d3, and if black now plays knight to f6, then we play e4, and if black accepts the gambit, then we take back, and we open everything up. So, in this video, I'm going to show you eight games, games that have to do with all of the different forms of the Dutch defense, as well as other setups that Black can go for against the delayed Lizards and Gambit. I hope that you enjoy! So for this first game, we're going to look at what happens when Black accepts the Gambit. So, as you might remember, Knight to f3, f5, d3, Knight to f6. This move order by Black here is one of the most uh, flexible move orders in the Dutch defense. Like, generally, if your opponent plays f5 on move 1, that often implies that they know multiple forms of the Dutch, and that they might choose their preferred form of the Dutch based off of how you respond to it. Like, they might not have yet decided whether they want to play a Stonewall Dutch, a Classical Dutch, or a Leningrad Dutch. And so f5 and knight f6, these two moves appear in every single different form of the Dutch. So if your opponent doesn't know about this gambit, you'll very often see these as moves 1 and 2. So here, even though it looks like black controls the e4 square, we play e4 anyway because we are going to gambit this pawn. And black really should not accept the gambit. If black takes, we just take back, and we will now have a pawn in the center. We're quite happy. So black will very likely now take with their knight, because otherwise, why did black, you know, take our pawn in the first place, you know, giving up some control of the center with their f-pawn? Their f-pawn. We play bishop to d3. And if you are a long-time viewer of this channel, you might recognize this position as this 
gambit looks a lot like another gambit that I have covered on this channel. You might remember that um, earlier I did some videos on birds opening, in particular Fromm's Gambit, and the Knight F6 Fromm's Gambit actually shares some similarities with this line. The only real difference is, of course, that in our case, we are up a tempo. Like here in this position, in the Fromm's Gambit position, it is white to move, but in our position, over here, when the knight goes back to f6, it will also be white to move. It will be our turn to move. And that extra tempo is going to make all the difference. Sometimes, whether an attack succeeds or fails is all just a matter of one tempo. So, in this position... The engine is saying that it's about equal, but really there's only one move for black that's remotely playable. And that move is the move pawn to d5. Black plays pawn to d5, and we're just very happy to take and trade queens. And now play knight to g5, threatening to fork the king, on, king and rook with knight to f7 check. And also win back the pawn. And objectively, this might be about equal, but from a practical standpoint... White has won every game that features this position in the Lee Chess Masters database. It's like, basically, what's going on is Black might have the bishop pair, but White can still castle. In fact, White should castle queenside so that the rook comes to an open file right away. And White has an isolated e-pawn on an open file to play against. So white is just going to have a very good time here, and it is very unlikely that black will go into this position willingly. Like, over here, it's much more likely for black to now play the move. Knight to f6, kind of going into a reversed, you know, Brahms gambit. So here, we can just continue the aggression. We can launch an attack with the move knight to g5 with all sorts of nastiness. The immediate threat is bishop takes h7 check. Black cannot take back with the knight because the queen will come to h5 and in this case that will even be checkmate. There are also ideas where even if black makes some air, we could then put the knight on uh, what's it called? On f7 and maybe win this rook over here. You know, all kinds of nasty stuff. There isn't a good move for black in this position. White's attack is just overwhelming. So in the game that we're going to look at today, black now play the move pawn to g6, trying to safeguard the pawn on h7. But this isn't really going to work. In this position, white could go for this idea that I covered in the Fromm's Gambit video of playing knight takes h7, and note that black can't play knight takes back because bishop takes g6 is mate. So after rook takes h7, bishop takes g6 check, rook f7. We could go for this idea of giving up the bishop and knight for the rook, but having two connected pass pawns over here. But white has to play in what sorry white has to play accurately in order to keep the advantage here. And why do this when we can win in a much more crushing way? So in the game that we're going to look at today, white play the move pawn to h4 with the idea of going to h5 and taking on g6. Note that black can't take back on g6 with their pawn because the rooks will then see each other and white will be able to win black's rook over there. So, black really doesn't have any good moves here. So, before continuing, I thought I should just very briefly introduce the players. With the white pieces, we have Grandmaster Bator Sambuev, who is a Russian-Canadian Grandmaster. And at the time that this game was played, he was not a Grandmaster. This game was played the year that... Um, he became an IM, so an international master. So at the very least, he was a very strong FM at the time of this game. 
And with the black pieces, we have Viktor Toporov. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know uh, that much about black, but I do know that black's peak rating was about 2200 fide. So it's likely that black had the title, or at the very least qualified for the title of Candidate Master. And well, part of the reason why I chose this game is because we get to see Black get completely destroyed. In fact, this game is very reminiscent of the games of Paul Morphy, because White basically develops all of their pieces, launches a massive attack on Black, and Black just has a very bad time. So, back to the game. So White plays pawn to h4, and Black tries playing pawn to e5, trying to muddy the waters a bit, trying to get a bit active here, trying to do something, trying to get some counterplay. The engine considers this inaccurate, but honestly, the engine's suggestions this game are not that great. I'm going to more or less ignore them. The engine here suggests playing pawn to d5, and then after h5, trying bishop to g4, f3, bishop takes h5, but we can just play pawn to g4, winning the bishop, and still keeping our aggression. So, the engine's suggestions, they are not very helpful. In the game, black played pawn to e5, trying to do something. White played pawn to h5, black played pawn to e4. White took, winning back a pawn, back to back, white took, black plays queen to e7, trying to interfere with this bishop, you know, taking on g6, all that kind of stuff, and also pinning the bishop to the king, threatening to win it, and so in true Morphe, Morphe fashion, white continued by just, you know, developing, white got their king to safety, with Castle's kingside getting ready to put their rook on e1 and continue the attack. Black cannot take the bishop because the queen will be pinned to the king. So black played king to d8, renewing the threats on the bishop. White now plays knight to c3. One thing that's important to note now is that white probably should not open up the h file anymore as there are ideas of queen to h4 and maybe you know mating on h1 or h2 and also defending the bishop is important too so anyway white played knight to c3 getting another piece into the game game also maybe getting ready to do knight to d5 at some point some nasty stuff like that black plays pawn to c6 you know, getting, uh, you know, stopping any knight to d5 ideas, and also maybe preparing to play pawn to d5. Like, white might even had ideas of just sacrificing this bishop with, like, knight to d5, and, like, bishop to g5 with a check, and then maybe the rook comes out, and maybe there's something there. So, black plays pawn to c6. White plays rook to e1, threatening a discovered attack on the queen, I mean, like, white could take this pawn too, but white probably wants to take the pawns near black's king because white is going for an attack. Black plays queen to f6, getting the queen out of the rook's line of sight. All right, we have bishop to e3. White is developing another piece and threatening to skewer the queen to the rook. And here, there aren't really any good moves for black. This is just awful. Black plays bishop to g7, but even though it looks like this might help, this might, you know, stop this threat of bishop coming to d4, in reality it doesn't. White just plays pawn to h6. The engine's suggestion really isn't much better. The engine is basically just saying, give up the exchange. And like, basically, play bishop to e7 so that the queen can come back to f8 and then take back the bishop. In this position here, bishop to e3, after bishop to g7, part of the problem with bishop to g7 is after pawn to h6, if the bishop goes back to f8, then after bishop to d4, the queen can't actually go anywhere to save the rook, so the bishop will just eat the rook, yum yum yum, white will be up a rook for free, so as a result, black decided to sacrifice their bishop, uh, white took back, 
And Black now plays pawn to d6, you know, trying to, you know, maybe get this bishop into the game somehow. Also grabbing some central space somewhat, although not really at the moment since the pawn is currently pinned to the king. White plays queen to d2, developing yet another piece and with another threat, threatening to pin Black's queen to the king. Black plays king to c7, getting the king to a safer square, and dealing with that threat. But black, but white plays bishop to g5 anyway, because this not only improves the position of the bishop, but it also forces the queen to a more passive square. Or like note that the queen can't go to you know a square. Well, shouldn't go to that square. <laughs> can't go to a square on the e file because of discoveries from this rook. So the queen is forced back. White plays bishop to f3, blocking the queen's line of sight on this pawn. Also allowing the rook to maybe come to e7. Then getting very nasty here. This is not fun. Black is kind of gasping for air. Air. Black really does not want to, you know, not want to have to deal with this. But black doesn't really have much choice. Black played pawn to d5, trying to maybe grab some more central space. There aren't really any great moves for black in this position. And part of the problem with pawn to d5 is that this is just a free pawn. So white took the pawn. The engine marks this move as a bit inaccurate by white. The engine wants knight takes d5 because apparently that's a forced mate in 12. But why, ha why play mate in 12 when you can make your opponent resign in just a few more moves? Like, resigns in 3 is much better than mate in 12, in my opinion. So if you want, you can pause the video and try to figure out why black really should not take back this bishop. To black's credit, in the game, black played the move bishop to f5. And so I will reveal why black should not take back take this bishop in three, two, one. So the reason why is after pawn takes, white just takes back with the knight and with chuck. There are only three legal moves for black's king and none of them are all that good. If king to d7, we don't even necessarily need to go for checkmate. Like we could just play knight b6 check with a double check and win the rook over here. Black would probably just resign here. And if king to d6, we could do the same thing. But we could also play bishop to e7 with a check, winning the queen. So neither of those is good. If king to c6, then I like the very simple move, queen to c3 check. Basically hitting the king and also hitting this rook over here. Black's best move is actually to block with the queen, giving up protection of the rook. If black instead plays king to b5, then we have pawn a4 check. Oh, there's only one legal move for the king. Knight to c7 check, king to b6, and then a very funny checkmate with pawn to a5. But, you know, black does not want that. And of course, king to d7, this is checkmate. And if king to d6... Queen here, king takes here, this is checkmate as well. So as a result, after queen c3 check, best move is queen to c5. And now we can give this check with the knight so that, you know, the king can't take the knight anymore. But more importantly, the king is going to be probably forced away from the queen. Black is going to lose their queen. We don't even necessarily need to win this rook. Rook. Like, Black's king is going to be forced to b6 at some point, because if the Black king just sucks back, we just take the queen. So if king a4, for example, we give this check, king b6, bishop to e3, and that will just pin the queen to the king and win. So yeah, Black really cannot take the bishop on d5. To Black's credit, Black played the move, bishop to f5. White now plays rook a d1, bringing their last piece into the game. Black played knight to d7, and white played bishop to e6. And in this position, black decided that they had had enough. Black 
decided to resign here, and I don't blame them, because not only is White up a piece, but White has a much safer king, White is, and White has all of their pieces in the, the game, and Black is just getting crushed here. Like, Black actually played okay this game. Black's only real mistake the whole game was just accept, upset, accepting a gambit when they don't know the theory. Like, gambits are very sharp, so it's very important if you accept a gambit that you know what you're doing. One way that the game could continue is with the moves. Bishop takes e6, rook takes, white is threatening, queen takes d7. So black could try to save their knight with, you know, the knight coming over here. Rook e7 check. Black should probably come out to b6, but it's more human to play king to c8. Queen to d6, threatening checkmate, and also threatening this knight. And... Of course, knight to a6 will be met with queen d7, and then queen takes b7 with mate. And if queen to d8, we could take the knight, but we could also just play queen to e5 with, you know, too many threats on the board for black to deal with. So, just to review, we begin with knight to f3, black plays pawn to f5, we play d3, getting ready to play pawn to e4. If black has never seen this line before, black will probably play knight to f6 now. We play pawn to e4. It looks like we're just losing a pawn for nothing, but in reality, there is just so much aggression, so much venom in this position. The best move, objectively, for black is to play pawn to d5, but this is very unlikely because we just take... We trade the queens, and we come here, and we're just going to have a very pleasant middle middle game. Win back our, our pawn, castle queenside, put our rooks on the open files, and play against this isolated e-pawn. And of course, if instead black retreats the knight, we play knight g5, and we go for a devastating attack. And if black now plays g6, we play h4, and we're just going to get in there, and we are going to destroy the Dutch. So, I hope that you enjoyed this game. On to the next one. So for game number two and number three, I thought that I would look at the stone wall and how to deal with that. So, as before, we begin with knight to f3. Black plays pawn to f5. We now play d3, getting ready to play e4. And so black plays pawn to d5, stopping us from playing e4. And this move generally indicates to us that black is going for a stonewall formation. Since in the other forms of the Dutch, the d-pawn does not go to d5. It usually goes to d6, and then the e-pawn usually goes to e5. So the stonewall is a very solid defensive formation. Like, it can also lead to some kingside attacks, but generally at higher levels, the stone wall is used for defense, in which black is going to put their pawns on these squares over here, and black is going to be very strong on the light squares, but is going to have some dark square weaknesses, in particular the e5 square. And generally, the stone wall is very difficult to penetrate. So as a result... We're going to try to destroy it. We're going to try to penetrate it. So in this position here, here, we should not play the move pawn to e4. This move does not work anymore because black can take with a d-pawn. And if we take back, then black takes away our castling rights. And then black can take this pawn. And here, objectively, white might be okay. We might be fine. But this is not really what we want out of the opening. Like, we will likely be able to win this pawn back, but we have lost our castling rights. And, you know, like, it's still very equal. Like, there are some dynamics, like in the form of these pawns over here, but this is not what we want. We want to play for, you know, a better advantage. Just thought I should show the evaluation over here. The engine actually slightly prefers black in this position. So... Anyway, back over here, since e4 doesn't work, 
as is normal in the King's Indian, will play c4 instead, the other pawn break. And so here, there are a number of ways that black can respond. And in the game that we're going to look at now, black played e6, which is, you know, a very normal stonewall move. c6 is going to be looked at in the next game. And one thing that should be noted is that if black does take on c4, we again do not want to take back with our pawn because we will lose our castling rights. So instead, what we can do is we can play pawn to d4 now. And even though we've kind of burned a tempo, this position, it's basically like a queen's gambit accepted, except black put their pawn on f5 for whatever reason. And, you know, that's pretty weird. Like, this pawn over here, as is normal in the queen's gambit, black's probably not going to be able to hold on to it. And this pawn on f5 is probably more of a hindrance than a benefit here. Like, again, we have a bit of a slight advantage here, even though we have given up a pawn. Sadly, even though this particular position is quite interesting, there are no, you know, games at high level that feature this. this even though it is, you know, kind of some interesting imbalances here. So, in the game we're going to look at now, Black played the move pawn to e6, and already we're going to get to destroy the stone wall. We're already going to break it down. So we take on d5, black takes back, and then as is normal in the king's Indian attack, we're going to play pawn to g3, black plays knight to f6, bishop to g2, black plays bishop to d6, black is developing their pieces as is normally done in the stone wall. Normally these pieces do go here. Castle kingside. Castle kingside, and now here white plays knight to c3 with the idea of now just ripping everything open with the move pawn to e4. And in this position, black went for the move pawn to c6, and white, of course, got in the e4 pawn break. So before continuing, I thought that I should just introduce the players. So with the white pieces, we have Grandmaster Pavel Blotny, who is a Grandmaster from the Czech Republic, and who is at least two times the Czech National Chess Champion. And uh, I believe that this particular year, 1990, was one of the years where he won the Czech Championship. And he was not yet a Grandmaster at this point in time, but I think he was an IM. And with the black pieces, we have I am Ladislav Salai, who I'm not sure if if he was a uh, I am at this point in time. He is also a uh, grandmaster in terms of uh, chess composition, like in terms of uh, puzzle solving. And unfortunately, I could not find uh, a photo for him. Um, like normally, these photos that I show here, I usually grab from the FIDE profile, and if there isn't one, I usually try to grab one from somewhere else. But sadly, I could not find a uh, photo for Black. And um, this particular game was played in the Tatran Cup in 1990. I believe that is a tournament in uh, the Czech Republic, either that or in Slovakia. And uh, yeah, back to the game. So white has played the move pawn to e4, striking at the center, threatening to the move pawn to e5, uh, you know, just getting ready to wreak some havoc here. So black decided to take, and white took back, and black took back with this pawn. It should be noted, of course, that if black takes with a knight, we can take with our knight, and then after this, we can now play queen to b3 check. Heck, there isn't really any nice way of blocking this check. King to h8, knight to g5, and the point of this move isn't just to attack this pawn. A much nastier threat, as if black makes a silly move like pawn to a6, is of course this very standard pattern of knight f7 check. Black has to trade their rook for the knight because, you know, they'll lose their queen. But if black is feeling particularly silly, it's important to remember this pattern. The Philidor mate. And, uh, yeah. Uh, that's a pretty nasty threat to meet. 
like black could try meeting it with queen e7 just to cover the f7 square and then after knight takes e4 bishop to e6 queen to c3 black stone wall has been destroyed the center has been blasted open white pieces are coming to life and the weaknesses that black has created along this diagonal are going to be a problem black has kind of opened up their king and we are now hitting this bishop over here and there isn't really that nice of a place for it to go to. White is going to get active. Active. But this is not what happened in the game. I just thought I would show this line just in case you were curious. Like, what if black took in a different order? Anyway, back in this position, black took like this. White took back. Black, with the, black took with the pawn, keeping their knight over here, like generally a knight on f6 or on f3 is very good, is a very good defensive resource for defending a king on the king side. So white again, play knight to g5, you know, similar nasty ideas. Because here, there isn't really any nice move for black. Like in the game, black played queen to e7, you know, with the idea of defending the f7 square. The engine, of course, is making suggestions that aren't really all that helpful. The engine suggests knight to a6, but white is just going to do this. Queen b3 check, king to h8, and then knight to f7 check. Black is forced to give up the rook, and white is just going to be up in exchange, and white will eventually win this pawn back. But this is not what happened in the game. Instead, after knight g5, black played the much more intuitive move, queen to e7, just to follow me developing a piece, guarding this f7 square over here. White took with the c knight, bringing another piece over to the king side because we're going on the attack. We're going to attack black. This is generally not the kind of situation that a stonewall player wants to be in. Usually you play the stonewall because you like, you know, having a very nice defensive structure in the center. So, in this position... Currently hitting this bishop over here. It's very tricky to find a nice move for black here. So black took over here. We took with the bishop. White took with the bishop. Black went for bishop to f5. Trying to develop a piece. Trying to deal with all of this nasty aggression. You know, maybe taking this pawn over here. It's just very unpleasant. Pleasant, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so, what's especially funny here is that the engine is saying black should try h6 and that white can just be really savage and play the move bishop to g6 and be like, yeah, you can't actually take this knight because, uh-oh, you know, or there, you know, here and then probably there if, you know, the rook moves. Like, uh-oh, that's, that's not good. So, anyway... This is not what happened in the game. Aim instead. Bishop to f5. And here the engine wants white to take the bishop over here. To trade and allow. Whoops. To trade and allow the rook to be developed. But I don't really like that. I think the move that white made this game was quite good. Like was just fine. Like from a practical standpoint. There is very little difference between plus 6 and plus 4. So making moves that are much more natural like i like that like if you have a choice between a complicated move move that might be a bit better and a simple move that still leaves you with a winning position i would say just take the simple move it leaves you more time on the clock for one thing anyway so rook to e1 with a threat of taking this bishop and with a discovered attack on the queen so the queen slides out of the way Taking is not good because the rook will be coming into the a party and then after a move like queen to f6 It's important not to blunder away this pawn you can play bishop to e3 and then get ready to Go after black's king get ready to really get in there So anyway, that's not what happened in the game that rook to e1 queen to d7 queen to b3 check King to h8, and here white went for rook to d1 with the idea of playing bishop to f4 and win this bishop on d6. 
Like, Black is just under so much pressure here. There, there are so many threats to deal with in this position. And, like, basically, here, there isn't really any nice move for Black to make. Like, if Black tries Bishop to G4, which happened in the game, my, my mistake, if Black tries a different move, like, Pawn to H6, we don't even care about this knight. We just do this. We just come out like this. And we're gonna hit both this knight and this rook. Black is in a lot of trouble. Like, Black can't save both. Because, basically, if Black moves the rook, we're gonna take the knight with a discovered attack on the queen. And basically be up a piece. So that's no good. And if Black tries to break the line of sight of the rook, hook, then we can just take like this. And after takes back, queen to d3, hits this rook, hits h7, hits this bishop. There are just too many threats for black to deal with here. Black is just going to lose material. But this is not what happened in the game. Instead, after rook to d1, bishop to g4 was played. And here, white made a very cool move. White played bishop to f4, fully understanding that... The peace activity that white has is so much more valuable than material. And in fact, white is not actually going to be losing material here. White is going to be getting the material back. Black plays bishop takes d1. White plays rook takes d1. And it was in this position that black now resigned because white is just going to win this bishop over here and have two bishops versus the rook. And two bishops can usually just bully the rook, especially when your opponent has no bishops. And not only that, but there is just so much aggression. aggression. All of white's pieces are coming into the game and wreaking havoc. Black decided to call it quits. If you want, you can pause the video and see if you can figure out why the move rook to f6 does not save this bishop. I will reveal the answer in... 3, 2, 1. So the reason why rook take, sorry, rook to f6 does not save the bishop is we can just take this guy again with some nasty threats of, you know, discoveries, all that kind of stuff. And then this is just, whoops. And what's especially savage is that we don't even take the queen. We all just grab checkmate with knight h6 and then like either queen f7 or queen to g8. So this was a very well played game by white. I like black stonewall just got completely destroyed here. Here. Here the delayed lizard sin is still very dangerous even if your opponent does not accept the gambit. I hope that you enjoyed this game. On to the next one. And now we're going to take a look at what black what to do if black plays c6. So recall knight f3, f5, d3, d5, c4. And so previously we looked at a game where black played e6. And if black plays d takes c4, remember to play d4, kind of transposed to a queen's gambit accepted. So now we're going to look at what to do after pawn to c6. So here, I quite like the approach that white took in this game. White just played the move queen to c2, just taking the queen off of this file. I know, and also adding some support to the e4 square. That's gonna be, that's gonna still be an important pawn break. So black continued with pawn to e6. Black has achieved the stonewall formation. So we're playing the king's Indian attack. White continued with pawn to g3. Bishop to d6. The bishop does go here in the stonewall. Bishop to g2. Knight to f6. Castles, castles, white plays knight to c3, and it's a similar idea as before. We're going to be playing pawn to e4. So black played queen to e7, and white plays pawn to e4, getting ready to take down this stone wall to basically show that this formation is not so solid. We're going to break it down. 
So before continuing, I thought I should just very briefly introduce the players. Once again, I could not find a photo for Black. I don't know what it is. Like, maybe, maybe this opening is so nasty that the players, the, the, the Dutch players, they're so humiliated that they're like, oh, no, I can't show my face anymore. I don't know. So, anyway, with the white pieces, we have Grandmaster Thomas Russell Roosman, who is a Grandmaster from Canada. And for whatever reason, he does not have a Wikipedia page. And I think that's really strange because Canadian Grandmasters are pretty rare. Here, like, there aren't a whole lot of them. And unfortunately, I don't know that much about him myself. And with the black pieces, we have Basim Mosin, who I believe is a player who plays for Bahrain, the Kingdom of Bahrain. And um, uh, his FIDE rating at the moment is 2200, so I would assume that it's kind of weird. Like, the FIDE uh, database doesn't show him as having the Candidate Master title, but... My understanding is that to get that title, you just need to get get your FIDE rating to 2200, so it's a bit strange. So I would give him the CM title, but he's not listed as having it on the FIDE website. But anyway, this game took place at the Chess Olympiad, and now back to the game. So White has just played Pawn to E4 and is getting ready to get all nasty over here. Now white wants to play pawn to e5, forking the bishop and knight. Or maybe white wants to shatter the center by taking on d5. You know, shatter this stone wall. So black decided, no, you're not going to shatter me. I'm going to shatter you. So black played d takes e4. White took back. And black now went for pawn to e5. The engine doesn't like this, but black didn't really have that many options here. If black did go for f takes e4, which is the engine's recommendation, then we'll kind of play things, you know, as before. We'll play knight to g5, win back the pawn, and black will have an isolated e pawn that we can play against here. Suddenly, black's structure in the center is not so solid. Suddenly, black has a weakness that we can go after. And this is just a very pleasant position. For whites, but this is not what happened in the game. Instead, after d takes e4, black tried, you know, playing a bit more aggressively with pawn to e5, trying to take some central space. Of course, the issue with this move is that it does hang the pawn on f5, and this in turn, by capturing here, we get access to some squares in black's camp. So black decided to now play queen to f7, hitting the pawn on c4. White now played pawn to b3. I think this move by white was just fine. I think this move is very intuitive. Just defend the pawn. This is a nice pawn in the center. Let's keep it here. The engine, of course, prefers pawn to h3 and doesn't even care if black takes this. Like, if black takes this, just pawn to g4. Keep this guy here. This pawn is really annoying for black to deal with. Like, it's kind of hilarious. We have a pawn on f5, and yet we didn't have to push our pawn off of f2, so we kind of get to have our cake and eat it too. But this is not what happened in the game. Instead, white played pawn to b3. Very reasonable move. Black now played pawn to h6, because black was probably worried about some knight g5 ideas. You know, hitting the queen. Maybe the knight also jumps to e6 at some point. Probably not now, since that would lose a pawn, but there are ideas of that in some lines. Anyway, so, pawn to h6, knight to h4, you know, kind of adding some control to the e4 square, and also just adding some overprotection to this pawn over here. Knight bd7, white now plays bishop to b2, because there isn't really anything for this bishop to do on this diagonal anymore. Like, it doesn't really seem all that well placed on e3, because what's it really got to do over there? Not much, really. This bishop... It seems to have a brighter future over here, where maybe this pawn, we get rid of it at some point. You know, it's an isolated pawn. We want to play against that thing. So, black plays rook to e8, adding some support to the isolated central pawn. 
Back is kind of the only player with a pawn in the center, although I suppose this pawn kind of counts. But, you know, with the King's Indian attack, we kind of play in a very hyper-modern style where we don't always control the center with our pawns, we like to use our pieces. So anyway, White continued with Rook AD1, adding some more control to the center. Rooks belong on open files, as they say. Black's bishop is under attack. Black decided to improve the positioning of their bishop. Black kind of notices this nice square here that maybe they can make use of. So White now plays pawn to h3, taking away the g4 square from the knight. And there are ideas of playing pawn to g4 just to defend this guy. Black plays knight to f8. It's kind of a bit of a passive move. I don't like this move so much, but then again, it's kind of hard to, for Black to move in this position. Like, this bishop is very sad. It wants to get into the game, but we can't really push this pawn to let the bishop out this way because, of course, this bishop is eyeing this little target over here. So, white continued by developing another piece. White played rook f to e1, adding even more control to the center, bringing the other rook to an open file. We have bishop to d4. Knight goes back to f3. The knight isn't really needed here anymore. The knight really isn't going to go here because, you know, this knight is probably happy to trade, even if that does mean getting a, you know, white getting a strong pawn on g6. That would, you know, kind of improve this bishop. Anyway, black plays pawn to c5, trying to solidify their best piece. Kind of adds some more defense to this guy because white was threatening to just win a pawn with knight takes. takes and, um... Here, the problem with pawn to c6 is that this move was weak, like it weakened some squares in black's camp. So white plays knight to b5, and the square that it weakened was the b5 square in particular, also the d5 square, knight to b5. We're looking at knight to d6 with some nasty, you know, fork of the queen and the rook. And if the queen moves to h5 or something, there's knight to c7. This is just not a fun position for black to be playing. Like if the queen goes onto the e or the d file, these rooks, they are pinning things. There's going to be some material loss. Uh, and so, like maybe black could try moving this rook or something, but this is, this is not a fun position for black. It is very hard to play black side. Like, it's very hard not to lose material here for black. I don't even think it's possible. Black plays bishop takes f5, basically trading some bishops. I, I think that this was black's best option. Like, black's basically going to go down in exchange, but at the very least, black is going to improve their pieces. So black takes here, white takes back, bishop takes b2, white brings their queen back because the queen was a bit loose over here, and we hit this guy with tempo. Black puts their bishop back onto d4. White now goes for knight to d6, hitting both the queen and the rook, hitting both these guys. Queen to c7, knight takes e8, rook takes e8, and now white just starts to simplify by getting rid of black's best piece. Like, you don't always necessarily want to trade pieces when you're up material. Sometimes it's wrong, but in general, you want to trade bad pieces for your opponent's good pieces. And here, the knight... It wasn't so great. It didn't really have any good squares to go to. Maybe h4. But Black's Bishop, it was kind of a thorn in white side. So it makes sense to just trade this guy away. Black took back with the c-pawn. Taking back with the e-pawn doesn't help matters. We just trade even more. Not only that, but this knight is forced to be passive in this case. We give a check. King goes here. We just get active. And after knight to f6, just play rook e1. We're not worried about this pawn, pass pawn at the moment, because pass pawns, they don't matter as much when there are still queens on the board, when there's still the problem of, you know, like, king safety of maybe this rook coming in, and the queen takes that guy and that guy and just going up a full piece, you know, stuff like that. Uh, like, so... Black did not go for c takes d4. Instead, black tra sorry, black did not go for e takes d4, I should say. 
I can instead try to keep more pieces on the board and not get overwhelmed by aggression, not get pushed back and be forced to be passive. So white now decides to bring their queen back to f5. White's like, okay, I, I can get aggressive now. Maybe moving the queen back to c2. Maybe that wasn't that necessary. But at the same time, it you know, if it was a waste of time, black didn't really get anything out of that. Black tries playing queen to f7. The engine doesn't like this move, but it's pretty difficult to find a good move for for black. Like, the engine prefers, like, knight here just to add some defense to this pawn, but white could continue with this move, for example. Ample, like, basically trying to get this pawn to take so that we can take this guy, or otherwise just, you know, oh, take this guy and get rid of that guy. Like, all that kind of stuff. So... Queen f7 is by no means a losing move. Black was already just in a very bad position. White wins the pawn on e5. Black plays g6. White plays queen to f4. Black plays knight to e6. Black's position is just falling apart. The queen takes the pawn on h6. Black plays rook to f8. It's actually very, very hard to find a move here for black. That doesn't just straight up lose material. So, black plays rook to f8. And if you want, you can pause the video to find the move that white now played that led to black just resigning the game. So, I will reveal the answer in 3, 2, 1. So, the final move of the game was the move rook takes e6, and black resigns here because black cannot take back this rook. If black plays queen takes rook, then white will play queen takes g6 with check. It's very important to do this first, because we want this queen to pin this knight to black's queen, and then, so we're giving this check, the king can only go to h8. We then play queen back to h6 with a check, there are only two possible moves. Knight to h7 will lose the queen to queen takes e6. And king to g8 will lose the queen to bishop to d5. Pinning the queen on e6 to the king on g8. So overall, this was just a very well played game by white. The stone wall, it just kind of got shattered. Black was just kind of overwhelmed. Um, like, if Black's going to be trying to play the Stonewall Dutch against us, Black's going to need to rethink their strategy and rethink their move order. Black's going to need to change things up a little. So, just to review a bit when it comes to the Stonewall, we play Knight to F3, Black plays F5, we play D3, Black plays D5. We should not play E4 now, because Black can take with the D-pawn. If we take back, takes, 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 we should not do this. This position is bad. Black actually has a slight edge here. Instead, what we will do is we will play pawn to c4, and now if black takes, we'll just play pawn to d4, and this will be like a queen's gambit accepted, except there's a pawn on f5 for whatever reason. Dutch players, they usually don't want this position. So instead, it's much more likely that we'll see either e6 or c6, especially if your opponent really wants to commit to a stone wall. So if our opponent plays e6, then we can just take on d5. Opponent will capture away from the center. Opponent probably does not want to be you know, developing their queen so early in the opening. We play g3, knight f6, bishop g2. Bishop d6, castles, castles, and then we play knight to c3. We're going to get ready to play pawn to e4. And back over here, if instead our opponent plays pawn to c6, then we're not going to take, because our opponent could take back with this pawn, and they'll still have, you know, a pretty strong grip on the center. We won't have blasted a huge hole in the center, like in the center of the stone wall, we'll have blasted, you know, things open on the C file. So instead we'll play queen to C2, getting our queen off of this file, 
and adding some support to, you know, playing pawn to e4, pawn to e6, pawn to g3. We're going to continue in the King's Indian attack style. Bishop to d6, bishop to g2, knight to f6, castles, castles, and once more, we'll play knight to c3 with the idea of playing pawn to e4. So, I hope that you enjoyed this couple of games on the stone wall. On to the next setup. And now on to the classical Dutch. So as before, we begin with the moves knight f3, pawn to f5, d3. Black might play e6 here. Black might also just play knight f6 first. We're going to play pawn to e4 in both cases. And basically, if, uh, you know, black goes for this knight f6, e6 stuff, black is generally going for the classical Dutch. What this means is that black is generally going to try to develop their bishop to e7 or to b4. If that's good instead, then castle kingside, then play d6, and then try to play for pawn to e5. Like in the classical Dutch, it's all about getting these pawns to e5 and f5 before you do anything else before you go for any side any kind of kingside attack there are, there might be ideas of queen e8 queen jumping over here if the bishop is on e7 maybe it goes to f6 and the knight goes to e4 you know that kind of stuff but we're not going to have to worry about any of that because we're not going to allow it in this position we're going to play pawn e5 and the position is going to kind of turn into like a bad Alakine or a bad French. We're going to play pawn e5, just kick this knight away. If the knight, of course, goes to h5, which is kind of a silly move, like it's, you know, potentially going to be hit by this queen. Or you can just play pawn to h3 with the threat of playing g4. And black will have to play pawn to g6 to stop that threat. And then we can just play d4 to add some defense to this nice strong pawn on e5. And we'll play g4 at the right moment. And really, this is not a position that black's going to enjoy because in the classical Dutch, you usually don't want to be putting your pawn on g6 because that just creates so many dark square weaknesses around the king. And like in the Leningrad Dutch, maybe you're okay with that. But this does not look like a good Leningrad. So anyway, that's what we would do if black played knights to h5. Knight to g4 is also silly. Knight to g4, we just kick this guy. And then after this, we can take. Like maybe there's better stuff. But just messing up the pawn structure like this already looks very good. And knight to g8 is just silly. We just play d4. Yes, we might have burned a tempo by playing d3 before playing d4, but black has burned a tempo by putting the knights back in the corner. So anyway, it's much more common for whites to try moving their knight to a more, more active square with knight to d5. We can now play pawn to c4, chasing the knight once more. And most common move here for black is to play bishop to b4 with check. Black can go for knight to b6, but this just looks like a really nice alakine. I mean, this just looks like an awesome alakine, because generally, in alakine's defense, you do provoke these pawns forward, but you usually want to break away at them with, like, pawn to d6. You're usually not playing pawn to e6 and f5 and making this bishop miserable. Like, this position looks kind of like if we took the worst aspects of the Alakine and the French and we mushed them together. Like, this just looks awful. But, uh, anyway, what happened in the game to th that we're going to look at is black played bishop to b4 check, but this isn't really that much better. We can just play bishop to d2. This kind of forces a trade, since both the bishop and the knight are under attack. Bishop takes d2. We'll take back with the queen because our knight wants to come to c3. And here the knight can go to b6 as before. But we'll just play d4 as you know mentioned before. And so black might try knight to e7. And we can still go for a pawn to d4. The engine considers this to be slightly inaccurate, but 
Really, it's just a minor matter of move order. The engine prefers just playing knight to c3 first and then playing pawn to d4. I don't see why. I don't think it makes a difference. Anyway, black now castle. Knight to c3. Pawn to d6. And before continuing, I thought I should just very briefly introduce the players. So these two players, they are both international masters from the Philippines. Uh, White is a also a coach on Lee Chess, and uh, I believe Black became an IM in the year that this game was played, so pretty recently, so congratulations to Black. And unfortunately, I could not find much more information about the players or the event, but anyway, back to the game. So Black plays pawn to d6, trying to you know, trying to breathe, like trying to get some air here since Black is kind of suffocating. Black is having trouble getting their pieces into the game. White took. Black took back with the pawn because not only would taking with the queen make this into a backward pawn, but the e5 square would potentially be a very serious weakness. White played bishop to e2. Black plays knight to g6. Black is trying to play for the e5 pawn break which is very important in the classical Dutch. It's very important that you get in, you know, the move e5 so that you can have some very strong control of the center, very strong central pawns before you go for any kinds of kingside attack, any kind of that stuff. So white's not going to allow the move pawn to e5. White plays pawn to h4, getting ready to kick this knight once more. Black played rook to e8. The engine instead would prefer for black to play pawn to h6. The reason why is just to stop white from putting their pawn there. But if black plays pawn to h6, we play pawn to h5 anyway. And then after knight to e7, knight queen to f4, and just never allow black to get in this pawn break. If black can't get in this pawn break, then the classical Dutch is just busted. Like, there isn't any nice way to stop pawn to h5. If black plays pawn h5, then that will weaken the g6 and g5 squares permanently. And we can probably just play knight to g5, and I don't see any nice way to defend that pawn on h5. It would just kind of lose a pawn, and it would be a pretty important pawn. But anyway, not what happened in the game. Instead, black played rook to e8. We play pawn h5, knight to f8, pawn to h6. You know, trying to break things open on the king side here, trying to take and then play queen to h6, you know, that kind of nasty stuff. So black's trying to keep things closed over here. White decided to castle queen side, bring their rook onto this file. Also getting the king to safety, that's pretty important too. We have knight bd7. White now storms with pawn to g4. Black really does not want to take this pawn. At least not with their pawn, because that would open up their king a bit. That would make it easier for white to attack. So black plays knight to f6, because white is pretty happy to take that pawn with their knight. So white plays pawn to g5, cramping black and taking more space, at least even more. Black tried playing knight to e4, trying to instigate, trying to do something. But white just took and messed up black's pawn structure. White now played knight to h2, possibly with some ideas of going to g4 and then to f6. You know, the knight would be extremely strong on f6 because there are no pawns that can kick it away. Black now got in the move, pawn e5, but it's kind of, you know, unfortunately, it's not going to help too much. White took. Black took. White now plays pawn to f4. To add another defender to the g5 pawn. Black really does not want to take on Passant because white can take back with the rook, maybe. Maybe, or maybe even with the bishop. Like, there would just be so many open lines over. So many open lines around the king that white can make use of. Even if white, you know, loses a pawn somehow over here, it's still not a fun position for black to be playing. So black did not take, black did not open things up even more. Black played rook to c5, and white grabbed this nice free pawn over here. 
Black took back. White took. Going up a pawn. But black has traded queens. So that does make attacks on the king more difficult. Black played bishop to e6. Trying to go after this guy over here. White dropped back. Defending the pawn and also hitting this guy. We have pawn to b5. Knight to g4. This knight, it might be coming here, it might be coming here. This knight has a very nice future. So black decided to take the knight. If black instead took this pawn over here, then there's some cool ideas with knight to f6 check. And the king cannot really come to f7 because the knight will just take this rook. Sorry, take this pawn and be hitting the rook. And also with the possibility of coming here, you know, winning material, like winning a pawn on c4. So as a result, the king would kind of have to go to h8, and then we'll just kind of trade. White will be doing very well here. Here, So instead, black decided to trade for this strong knight. White took back, and black decided to take over here with their pawn. This is not so good. The engine instead prefers for black to try to defend this pawn, but this will not really help that much. White will just play rook to e1, and then after pawn to e3, White can defend this pawn on c4 tactically with bishop to f3 because there are ideas of giving this check. After knight to e6, you can play rook to e4, you know, kind of pinning the knight to this rook for the time being, and also getting ready to win this pawn. Knight to c7, maybe trying to trade over here, try to trade some rooks. Looks because, you know, white's rooks are currently more active than blacks. So we'll take this guy like this. King to f8. And overall, white would just be doing very well here. Like, white will be up two pawns in the long run and just win this endgame. But this is not what happened in the game. Instead, black took this pawn with their pawn, kind of making this pawn permanently weak. And also maybe this pawn too, but this pawn in particular is going to be very easy to pick off now. White played rook to e1. Black played pawn to c3. White played pawn to b3 because white does not really want to trade here. White wants to keep this pawn as a target. This pawn is not going to promote because white's king is doing a good job just sitting in front of it. And here black went for rook to b8. One thing that's interesting to note is that if black tries getting a bit active with like rook to e8, you know, rook takes, rook takes, rook takes, and then try to break through with rook to d5, white, there's actually a very cool idea with bishop to e2. This effectively prevents the move bishop, sorry, rook to d2. If you want, you can pause the video and try to see why rook to d2 would not work. Why this move would completely fail. I will reveal the answer in 3, 2, 1. So in this position, the move rook to d2, it just fails. It just loses material to the move bishop to c4 check. Like basically black has to block with knight to e6. And that's a pretty unpleasant move to be making. If black plays king to h8, then rook to e8 will just end up taking this knight on f8 with checkmate. Black can't breathe. Black is just stuck in the corner. But this is not what happened in the game. Instead, black played a bit more passively because really there isn't much else that black really can do. Black played rook b8. White took the pawn and activated their other rook. Black dropped back to c7, trying to defend the 7th rank, because white might try to, you know, put both their rooks on the 7th rank, and then try to maybe break through over here and hit this guy, you know, stuff like that. White plays king to c2, black plays king to f7, trying to activate their king, but it's not going to work. White played rook to c4, black played rook b, b7, white played king takes c3, and it was in this position that Black decided to call it quit. It's Black decided to resign. Like, one reason why is because, um, like, normally I would say that, um, 
you shouldn't resign here, that you should play on a little bit more. But at this level, you know, with both players being IMs, I can kind of understand why. Like, basically, the reason why Black resigned here is because Black is just so cramped. Like, not only is Black down two pawns in this endgame, but Black's king and knight cannot ever get into the game. Like, one strategy for white here is to just keep this rook on e4, where it defends this pawn, and where it guards this file, and keep this bishop on this diagonal. This way, if black ever tries to get their knight into the game, we just take it. We just trade a dead knight. With, like, we just trade the bishop for the knight. We just start trading pieces, pieces, and basically we want to trade at least one set of rooks here. Like, basically, if these two rooks vanish from the board, for example, then essentially what white can do is white can, you know, start advancing these pawns up the board with their king. Like, have their king and two pawns here fight this rook and this pawn. And it's important to advance with this pawn first, just so that, you know, if you do this, you don't allow black to kind of freeze your progress with pawn a5. And yeah, just basically black can't breathe. Black has difficulty actually getting their pieces into the game. game. Like black doesn't really have any weaknesses to strike at in white, white's camp. White is just going to bring their pawns forward and convert this end game. So anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this game on the Classical Dutch. I have another game on the Classical Dutch where black plays with a move order that is much more correct. On to that one! So now we're going to look at how to deal with the classical Dutch if Black knows about our line and knows what they are doing. In other words, we're going to look at how to deal with Ginger GM's recommendation against the delayed Lizardson. So, as before, we begin with Knight F3. Black plays pawn to f5, we play d3, preparing to play pawn to e4, and now black might play knight to c6, and there's a very clever idea behind this move. Basically, if we play pawn to e4, then black is going to immediately play pawn to e5, and here there are not that many great moves for white. One of the best moves for white is pawn to d4, but what's really funny about this position is that this isn't really a delayed Lizardson or a Dutch anymore. This is actually the Vienna Gambit, but with the colors reversed. Like, pay close attention to the positioning of the knights and the pawns. And now we're going to go back in time and we're going to look at what the Vienna Gambit looks like. The Vienna Gambit starts from the Vienna game, e4, e5, knight to c3. And then after knight to f6, the Vienna Gambit is when white plays pawn to f4, and the main line continues with pawn to d5. So objectively, the Vienna Gambit is equal. But from a practical standpoint, if you know the lines really well, and your opponent doesn't have that much experience facing it, then you might be doing well. But the thing is, is that we do not want to be giving our opponent equality. We do not want to suddenly be becoming black and our opponent be becoming white. There isn't any good reason to be doing that here. Here, so we need to try something else. So instead of playing e4, which would allow a transposition to a reversed Vienna Gambit, we'll instead play pawn to d4. This burns a tempo, but there is a point to it. Like, it's now like we're playing the playing uh, a queen's pawn opening, and our opponent has played the Dutch defense, and they got in the move knight to c6 for free. But the thing to understand about the classical Dutch in particular is that very often this knight does not belong on c6. You generally do not want to be putting the knight on c6 in the classical Dutch because you're often playing for pawn to e5, you know, with these moves, pawn to e6, then later pawn to d6, and then pawn to e5. I've, and white will generally have put their pawn here on c4. But if your knight is on c6, and you've got your pawn on e6, then white can play pawn to d5, 
and be hitting the knight and this pawn. See, normally, if you play pawn to d5, black could just respond by pushing their pawn to e5 and be and just laugh at you, be like, ha ha, I got in, you know, I got in these two pawns. Like, these two pawns are what black wants. They want pawns on these two squares. So, the move knight to c6, it actually gets in the way of that. So, that is the idea here. So if black plays the classical Dutch, black will generally continue with pawn to e6. We will continue with our usual stuff. We'll be in Keto our king bishop with pawn to g3. Knight to f6, bishop to g2. And here, there are a few different ways that black could continue. If black gives this check over here, then we're just going to play pawn to c3. And if black goes back, we'll just play pawn to c4. One thing that is important, of course, if black gives this check, is we do not want to be playing knight to c3, because if black doubles our pawns, then this knight on c6 is actually useful. It's actually pretty valuable, because we don't want to be doing this d5, d takes e6 stuff, if, you know, we have doubled isolated C pawns, uh, like if that happens out of the deal, like the D pawn would vanish in that case. So as a result, if bishop b4 check, do not play knight to c3, we'll play pawn to c3 and then pawn to c4, and then if the bishop comes back, we'll play bishop to d2. You know, stuff like that. And if black just goes bishop to e7 right away, We'll play pawn to c4, and this is what we'll be looking at the, in this game. But one, th one thing that I thought I should very briefly mention is that if black tries going for e5 right away by playing pawn to d6, then we'll still play pawn to c4, and if now e5, we'll play pawn to d5, we'll kick this knight. This knight does not have many good squares to go to, it will most likely go to e7, it, uh, if it goes here, then we'll play queen a4 check, and black will have to play c6 if they want to save their knights, and that's a pretty dangerous idea, just given that we've got, you know, this bishop on this long diagonal here. You know, that's, that's pretty risky. I don't like that for black. Like, let's look at what the engine says about this. The engine says, bleh. So, yeah, black's not going to do that. At black going back to b8 is also a bit silly. Like, it, there's no reason to undevelop the knight like that. So, knight e7 is the most likely scenario here. Here, sorry, over here. Here, and here in this position, what we will do after like d5, knight e7, so we'll play knight to g5. And we're going to be borrowing some ideas from the bayonet attack variation against the King's Indian defense. Basically, this knight is pretty annoying over here. But if black tries kicking it with h6, then we'll play knight to, a knight to e6. And essentially be stopping black from castling. And also just harassing the queen. Harassing all of what black's pieces here. So black is very inclined to take. And give us this weak pawn on e6. But part of the problem with this. Is that the light square bishop becomes very very strong. Like not only will we have the bishop pair. But we'll have a very strong light square bishop that is just completely unopposed. We probably will lose this pawn. But we'll have some very good compensation for it. And this position. It no longer looks like a Dutch. It now looks a lot more like a King's Indian Except black has not yet fianchettoed their bishop. But this is not what happened in the game. Instead, black just played the normal move. Black played bishop to e7. White continued with pawn to c4, getting ready to play pawn to d5. And maybe take over here, here if this pawn tries coming to d6. So black played the usual stuff with pawn to d6. White plays pawn to d5, just getting ready to ruin Black's plans of um, of getting the pawn to e5 and having these two friends sit side by side. So Black played knight to e5, White played knight to d4, opening up this bishop, 
hitting this pawn over here. Black castle kingside. One thing that should be noted is that knight takes c4 would drop the knight. So black can't really do that here. Here, Otherwise, you know, we might not be too happy to lose this pawn since it's fairly useful. It's providing support to the pawn on d5. So here, black castled and white played queen to c2. And before continuing, I thought I should just very briefly introduce the players. So, both of these players, I unfortunately could not um, find too much information about. Oh, they are both Russian grandmasters, and they are both. They were both grandmasters when this game was played, and unfortunately, that's everything that I know. And so, anyway, the game continued with the move e takes d5. White continued with c takes d5, and black played knight to e8, and white continued with castles kingside, and currently, forgot to mention, the reason why black played knight to e8 is because we are hitting this pawn on f5, and we can see that black's position is a bit cramped here, and black's going to have a lot of trouble actually attacking us. Because part of the point of the um, pawn on e5 is that it would block this diagonal. Like generally if you're going to go for like a kingside attack or something, you want to lock up the center. You want to have a good lock on the center. Otherwise, you know, playing a move like pawn to g5 here would actually be very risky. So black continued with bishop to d7. White played knight to c3. We're both... Like, both players are just kind of developing their pieces, getting their pieces into the game now. Black played king to h8, getting the king off of this diagonal. White now decided to push in the center with the move pawn to f4. Black moved their knights with um, knight to g4. And white decided to kick the knights with pawn h3, which makes sense. And the knight went back to h6, because if it went back to f6, that would lose this pawn. Also on h6, the knight does provide some support to the pawn on f5. So white now continued with pawn to e4, striking in the center. Now it looks like white is the one who's going to be attacking black. So black tries challenging white center with pawn to c6. And here, white continued with the move king to h2. I quite like this move. I think it's a good idea. Like, the engine just wants white to take on c6. But after b takes c6, yes, it is true that we'll have given black some weaknesses in this position. But I kind of liked the pawn on d5. I liked that it was restricting black. Act. So, I, I prefer what white did in the game. Like, basically, king to h2, it does many things. Like, it hugs these pawns over here, which are, you know, they, they could use some defense. And it gets the king off of this vulnerable diagonal. So white played king to h2. Black played rook to c8. White kept advancing with the move pawn to e5. White is doing very well. Black's pieces are just miserable. They don't have a lot of squares to go to. Black decided to take in the center with c takes d5. But white did not even need to take back. White played pawn to e6. Part of the point of taking on d5 is just to activate the rook. It is currently on the same file as white's queen. So white plays pawn to e6, hitting this bishop. The bishop does not have many good squares to go to. It goes to c6, where it now blocks the rook. White plays queen to d3, getting the queen preemptively off of that file of the rook. Black plays knight to f6, trying to activate more of their pieces. White now plays pawn to b4, because white is currently kind of winning in the center and doing very well in the king side. So white decides, let's go strike on the queen side too. Like, how does that saying go, I'm winning on one side of the board, now to win on the other side? I think it's Karpov who said that. Uh, anyway, so white played pawn to b4 with the idea of later going pawn to b5. Black played knight to e4. White continued with pawn to b5. And there just aren't 
many great moves for black here. Here, like, for example, the most intuitive move is bishop to e8, but the problem with this move is that white will be able to now just take this pawn with no problem. Like, black had temporarily been up a pawn, and that was kind of black's only real compensation for, you know, their very unhappy position. But now white is just doing fantastic. Like, white might even be able to take this knight and win this pawn. And so... Overall, white is doing doing great here. Like black could try something like knight c5, but the queen could just drop back to b1, where it would support this guy and keep an eye on that guy. It's very hard for black to actually move anything. An alternative move that black could play here, which is the engine's preference, but still isn't all that great. The engine prefers knight takes c3, and then after b takes c6. The engine doesn't even want black to hang on to their knight, because after knight to e4, we can take over here and get ready to support this very strong pawn with the move rook to b1. And if rook to c3 is played, we can just play queen a6 first and then rook to b1. And white's position is just fantastic. This is just a very, very strong pawn. On but anyway, neither of these lines is what happened in the game. Instead, black went for bishop to f6, like getting ready for some cool tactics, like maybe ideas of taking here and then taking back with the rook or, you know, stuff of that nature. I took over here. Black took back with the pawn because, you know, otherwise these pawns, they're quite weak. Like black's trying for some kind of compensation. Like, currently, black has two pawns for the um, minor piece, so maybe black can make something happen in the center. But usually, when it comes to a minor piece versus pawns, like, especially if we're talking about the middle game, usually the extra piece is more valuable. So, white played bishop to b2, just uh, activating the bishop a bit better. Like, the bishop didn't really have anything to do over here because the pawn is in the way. And over here, like, these are potential targets for this bishop, so bishop to b2 makes a lot of sense. We have rook to e8. Black might be trying to win this pawn over here. Rook a b1. Queen to e7. And then, like, black, of course, has to be very careful of how they win this pawn, because if black had instead tried this like takes takes and then takes the issue is that white can take the knight and be threatening checkmate so that's why black did not do that that's instead black went for queen to e7 Evan white now played rook f e1 because this rook again was kind of being blocked by the f pawn there's more for the rook to do on the e file we have rook c7 Rook b c1. White is now setting their eyes on this pawn over here. Here it's kind of at the back of, you know, this little pawn clump. Black plays rook e c8. Black has to be careful not to lose their, their pawns because their pawns are really the only compensation that they have for the lost minor piece. White plays rook to e2. Black decided to trade now. I don't think trading now was so good, but at the same time, it's very hard to actually find good moves for black in the position. So, white traded back. Back, sorry, white took back, I should say. Black now played knight to g8, trying to improve the position of this knight, because really it wasn't doing anything anymore. Or, except, actually it kind of was doing something. It was stopping white from playing pawn to g4. Black played queen, queen takes e6. White now took on e4. You know, getting this stuff ready over here. Here, and black has to be careful with, you know, what they now do. Oh, because if black, say, takes back with the f pawn or the d pawn, like either one, then white can actually destroy the pawn on c6 because this rook is overworked. It's both defending this and it was defending the pawn on c6. It can't do both things. 
this will be checkmate. So as a result, instead in this position, black tried the move, pawn to c5. But this also doesn't help matters much. White play, g takes f5. We have a queen trade. And black now play the move, rook takes c1. And I quite like uh, the final move of the game. I quite like what white now did. It kind of looks like black is going to be, you know, winning, you know, winning the piece back. But white actually found a very nice move here that I quite like. Like, maybe it's not the best move, but it's a very cool one. After White played this move, Black just immediately resigned. Alright, so if you want, you can pause the video. I will reveal the move in 3, 2, 1. So in this position, White now played the move. Knight takes d6, both hitting this rook, but also threatening checkmate over here. So very nasty move, very strong move. These pawns are going to fall. Uh, white is going to have like the two bishops, and white is going to uh, uh, what's it called? Just uh, be up a piece in the end game. And, like for example, one possible way the game could continue is uh, rook one c seven, knight to f seven check, rook takes, pawn takes, knight f knight f six. And then just bishop takes d4, threatening to take the knight, and then play rook to e8 with, with check. And there just isn't really any nice way of stopping that. So I do actually kind of agree with black resigning in this case. Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this game. Just as a very quick review of how to deal with the classical Dutch, we play knight to f3. And if black plays f5, we play d3. If black plays knight to f6, we play e4. And if black now goes for e6, we're going to just chase the knight with pawn to e5. This is going to be kind of like an Alekin's defense where, you know, we're going to play this pawn to d4 and have a very nice center. And black's going to be very cramped. This bishop's going to be very sad. This pawn is going to kind of wish that it was back on f7 so it could come to f6 and challenge the center. So that's what to do if black doesn't know about our opening. If black just plays the classical dutch very blindly. Now if instead black knows more about our setup, black will play knight to c6. And here the important thing to remember is to burn a tempo with pawn to d4. And then if pawn to e6, we'll just continue with our normal stuff. If this bishop comes here, we'll just do this. And then if it goes back, we'll do that. And basically, the main idea that we're going to be going for here is we're going to be trying to stop uh, black from ever getting in the move pawn to e5. Like, if the pawn goes to d6 and stuff, we're going to try pushing this pawn and then taking this guy over here. Here. So that's the main idea to remember about the classical Dutch, is that it's all about getting these two friends over here. If we can stop that from happening, then we will ruin our opponent's classical Dutch. I hope that you enjoyed. On to the next setup. So now we are going to move on to the Leningrad. And with the Leningrad, we kind of have an interesting problem. Like, generally, the Leningrad does not actually match up very well against the delayed Lizardsen. So, as a result, white, off, white will often have many good choices, like many great ways to play. But there are not that many games that actually feature, you know, the delayed Lizardsen versus the Leningrad. But I did manage to find one. The final two games of the series, like the final two games after this one are going to be um, on what Leningrad players will usually play against us. So for this game, we began with knight to f3, pawn f5, play pawn to d3, preparing pawn to e4, and after knight to f6, we play pawn to e4, you know, same stuff as usual. And then Leningrad players will generally play pawn to d6 here, since in the Leningrad, you don't 
generally play pawn to e6. You usually you want to play pawn to e5 in one go. Like, one thing to note about both the classical Dutch and the Leningrad is they both want to get pawns on e5 and f5. In fact, the Leningrad can be thought of as kind of a hybrid between the classical Dutch and the King's Indian defense. So since we want to prevent black from having pawns on e5 and f5, best thing to do here is to just take the pawn on f5, because black can't take back with the pawn. After bishop takes f5, our pawn on d3, we're going to move it again, because its mission has been accomplished. Accomplished. We're instead going to have it come forward to help control the e5 square, and free up the d3 square for our bishop, like make it easier to develop this friend over here. So generally, a pure Leningrad will continue with pawn to g6, you know, just getting ready to pin Keto the bishop in castle kingside. And here, white can continue in a number of different ways. Like bishop to c4, I think, if I recall correctly, is the engine's top preference. Like this is a good move. Like just hitting this very weak diagonal here. here. The idea being that if black plays d5, and this square is extremely weak. We can probably put the knight on here at some point after we move our bishop, of course. But for the game we're going to be looking at today, white played bishop to d3, just threatening to take the bishop and force this pawn to come to f5, where, you know, we will again weaken another diagonal in black's camp. So black prevented that with queen to d7. Castle kingside. Black being kettles, and here takes takes, and there are again a number of good moves that um, White could go for here. Like White could play very simply with the move pawn to c4, like kind of treat this like a standard queen's pawn game strategy. We'll just develop the knight to c3, play rook to e1. Like very often against the Dutch, you want to get in the move pawn to e4 so that you can play e takes f5. And well, the thing is, is that even though we kind of burned a tempo by playing d3 and then d4, we don't have to worry about playing pawn to e4 anymore. We kind of already finished that. So this is a fine move that White can continue with here. But uh, the move that was played in the game we're looking at today was knight to c3. Part of the idea of this move is just to leave this c4 square free for um, maybe some checks along this diagonal. Like maybe we want to use that diagonal for some tactics, for, for some stuff to maybe attack Black's King. And before continuing, I thought that I should just very briefly introduce the players. So with the white pieces, we have Grandmaster Michael Royce who is a Grandmaster from Israel. He has done well in both national and international tournaments and has represented Israel multiple times at the Olympiad and other team events. And he was also a uh, second for the former World Championship challenger, Boris Gelfand. And with the black pieces, we have Grandmaster Alexander Belyovsky, who is a Grandmaster... Um, from, like, originally from the Soviet Union, then Ukraine, and then uh, later he moved uh, to Slovenia. And way back in the days of the Soviet Union, he was the USSR champion four times. And in the late 90s, he had a rating above 2700. So I would say that Black is kind of a former super grandmaster. And so anyway, back to the game. So, uh, in this position, black now played the move knight to d5, which is a bit inaccurate. Like, uh, the theory here hasn't really been developed so much, just because there really are not that many games that feature it. Like, Leningrad players, they, they're, they're pretty well versed in theory, and they generally will not allow you to play a line where you stop them from getting the pawns on e5 and f5. So, anyway, in this game, black played knight to d5. What the engine prefers black to do here is to castle kingside, at which point white can play queen to e2, hitting this pawn over here. And if black tries playing rook to e8, then this would drop a pawn, 
We'll make use of this square that we kept free. We'll give a check over here and then take on c7. And if instead black tries a move like pawn to e6, then we can play rook to e1 to basically just stop black from ever getting in the e5 push. So as a result, in my opinion, the best try for black is knight to c6, defending this pawn and also preparing to play pawn to e5. Here, white can continue with the move knight to g5. I've, you know, threatening to just get really nasty in here. Here with, uh, you know, knight to e6. So now if uh, black tries pawn to e5, we can give this check. There isn't any nice way of blocking it. And so black now plays king to h8. We play pawn to d5, kicking this knight. Best place for the knight to go is in the center, knight to d4. And then we can take over here. And then if this knight takes here, we can play knight to e6. Threatening mate, so black does not have time to take the rook. And um, this is a very interesting position, but it has never been reached. He said, I, I personally think that white is doing quite well here. Like, I, I like what white's doing. I, I really like this knight. Whereas this knight is, you know, not so much. It's a bit iffy whether this knight is going to be so good or not. Especially since if it comes back here, we can, we can take it if we want. Like, we can maybe trade. Maybe we can win this pawn. You know, all that kind of interesting stuff. Like, if uh, black plays rook g8, we can actually immediately take this pawn because we have the threats of knight takes g7 followed by queen takes a8. You know, fun stuff like that. So, anyway, this none of this was what happened in the game. Instead, in this position, black tried knight to d5, which is pretty creative, but, uh, you know, not really that good of a move. Uh, white plays knight to e2 here. White does not really want to trade knights here. White decides, hmm, there's a knight on d5 now. Maybe I should play pawn to c4. And also, maybe this knight can come to g3 with tempo on the queen. You know, all that good stuff. So, black decided to castle now. White played pawn to c4. Knight dropped back to b6. White plays pawn to b3. And... Basically, white's pawns on c4 and d4 are very strong, um, whereas black doesn't yet really have much of a grip on the center at the moment, when black's not doing so well. So, in this position, black developed with knight to c6, adding some pressure to this guy. White played bishop to e3. Black now played pawn to e5, trying to strike in the center. White played knight to g3, hitting the queen with tempo, as mentioned before. Here, black played queen to d7, which was inaccurate, and we're going to get into why. Instead, black should have tried, like, a better try is queen to f6. The reason why is because now if white plays pawn to d5, then black can respond with pawn to e4, hitting, you know, this knight, and also hitting the rook on a1. So... If white takes this pawn, black takes, 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 and then takes, and then black could even, black will even have time to play like rook to e8, eight, and just get a bit active here. Here, this is all crazy engine stuff, but it's still kind of interesting. So, the reason, so white uh, basically doesn't have to go for this, white doesn't have to go for e5. Instead, white could play d takes e5, and now if the pawn takes back, it's going to be an isolated pawn that white can play against. In fact, white could immediately blockade it if white really wants to. So black would probably take back with the knight. And after knight takes, queen takes, just play rook c1 and just have a very pleasant position. White would be doing very well here, here and can play for a win. Whereas with black, it's kind of unclear what black's plan should be in this position. But anyway, this is not what happened in the game. Instead, in this position, after knight to g3, the queen went back to d7. And the reason why this is inaccurate is because now if white plays pawn to uh, d5, pawn to e4 does not work at all because 
d takes c6 will hit the queen so there's no time to take either this knight or this rook you know something takes back on c6 and then you know this knight will probably jump to ooh, d4 and and basically in the very worst case for white white is going to be giving up their rook for two pieces but that's going to be a pretty good deal especially since you know this bishop will have some delicious dark squares to make use of in black's camp but anyway this is not what happened in the game black did not play pawn to e4 here black instead just retreated their knight with the move knight to d8 there really aren't that many good squares for the knight to go to the reason why it went to d8 is because of white's next move knight to g5 this knight is looking to get into e6 that's a very juicy weakness in black's camp so black played queen to e7 white played queen to g4 adding you know another piece that controls this weak square in black's side of the board so black played knight to d7 getting ready to play knight f6 kick the queen white plays rook a c1 just get the rook off of this nasty diagonal black now plays knight to f6 we have queen to h3 pawn to h6 and here white just played knight 5 e4 kind of cramping black stopping this pawn from coming forward so this bishop stays inactive also this pawn is under attack so black took white took back and in this position, black now played the very intuitive move, knight f7, just trying to defend this pawn. Black probably does not want to push either of these pawns, just because that would kind of weaken black's king even further. And the engine says that black should play the move queen to f7 and try to trade queens. But we can just take the pawn, and we'll just be up a clean pawn, and you know this pawn will be very weak because it's just isolated by itself. So, this is not what happened in the game. Instead, black defended their pawn with knight to f7. But things are just going from bad to worse. White plays pawn to c5. The rook on c1 is supporting this pawn. There are ideas of it coming to c7 at some point. So, black plays rook f d8. Defending the d pawn over here. here and, um, uh, basically, he, like, the engine prefers rook a to e8 just try to do something on the king side here but we could play cd6 and then after cd6 just bishop takes over here just win upon free if rook a8 looking to eat this guy there is queen to e3 with ideas of bringing the bishop back to b6 and putting the rook on c7 so overall black would be in black would still be in a lot of trouble here in my opinion, the engine's suggestion isn't really that helpful. Black just played rook fd8, you know, trying to, you know, just keep things together. White took on d6. The engine doesn't like this. The engine instead prefers for white to immediately go with queen to e6. And then after takes, takes. In the engine's eyes, black has to sacrifice this knight. Black has to give it up. Because if it goes to g5, then that loses, you know, a fairly important pawn. And going to h8 isn't really much better at all. Like, the rook just comes in. And then there are issues of this pawn coming up. And then the knight coming here to, you know, force the rook out of, in like, away from being in front of this pawn. And so, uh, anyway, this is not what happened in the game. Instead... White, instead of white playing queen to e6, white played c takes d6, and after knight takes d6, we have knight takes d6, queen takes d6, and now in this position, white won the pawn on h6, like after all those trades, h since the knight had to come away from f7, and um, uh, let's see, one thing I should, thought I should mention really quick actually is that if black instead decided to take with uh, the C pawn, which in my opinion is probably what I would have done, like I probably would have tried to hold on to this one just for a bit longer, 
Or you can just double the rooks. Or you can play rook to c2 and then bring the other rook to c1. Like, black can't put a rook on c8 because the queen is doing a good job of just controlling that stuff there. But anyway, a, uh, this is not what happened in the game. Instead, after rook f d8, takes, 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 white takes this pawn. We have rook d7, just trying to keep things together. Other, the seventh rank is going to be under fire. White plays queen to e6 with check. Black plays king to h7, hitting the bishop. Bishop drops back to e3, applies some pressure to this pawn over here, trying to tie up this rook a bit, even though, you know, you might have to worry a little bit of ideas of, you know, pawn to b6, you know, stuff like that. That's, of course, pawn to b6 might not really work because we can take here and then maybe take on c7 if the rook did not go to c8. But anyway, pawn to a5, white now plays rook to c4, black is forced to trade queens. Means like white is happy to trade queens, but white wants to get their pawn on e6 where it's stronger, where it's even more annoying. It becomes a pass pawn, which is difficult to deal with. So black play, sorry, white played rook to d4, threatening to checkmate eight black, or at the very least win this bishop. So black took, queen takes queen, pawn takes queen, black played rook to e7. Evan stopping this pawn from moving. White played bishop to g5. I forcing this rook to move. Move, like if the rook moves back, back, then, you know, the pawn can probably come forward. Or basically this rook is being forced away from the defense of this pawn. Black took on e6. White took on c7. And it was in this position that black decided to call it quits. It was in this position that black decided to resign. And normally I would say that, you know, you should play on for a few more moves, but I mean, the players are grandmasters. Black is down a pawn and black has no compensation for it. And black's pieces are just not coordinated very well. Like white is getting ready to just bring this rook into the game, you know, maybe make some luft or maybe play the king to f1, you know, stuff like that. Whereas black's pawns, on the king side in particular, are isolated and are just targets for white to attack. White could also, you know, put the rook here or bring the other rook to here. All that kind of stuff. Uh, black is just having a very bad time here, so... Oh, I totally understand why black would have resigned here. Anyway... In the next game, we're gonna look at what Leningrad players will usually play against us. I hope that you've been enjoying the game so far. So, before continuing with the main line, I thought that I should just do a quick recap of what to do against the Leningrad, as well as talk about another possible little sideline that black can go for. So we play knight f3, black plays f5, we play d3, if black plays knight f6, we just go for e4 right away. You know, same stuff as usual. Well, black might play d6. Six, like if they're playing the Leningrad. Uh, just to stop us from playing pawn to e5. Uh, black should not allow us to do this. You know, as we saw before with the classical Dutch, that could be pretty annoying with the knight jumping around. Oh, and being kicked around as we take a big center. So take on f5, black takes back. We now play d4 because the d-pawn has done its job on d3. Its whole purpose here was just to support the e4 push. Now we're going to get ready to, like after black plays g6, we can play bishop to c4 if we want. But in the model game that I covered, white played bishop to d3, which is also a fine move. Queen to d7. The castle, Black Wolf and Keto, and there are quite a few good choices here for white, like c4 is pretty logical, knight c3 has a cool idea, just keeping the c4 square free for if we want to do some checks. Next, we can also take, before doing either of these things, we can play rookie one. 
basically we have quite a few good choices here. Here, there are not that many games that feature this line because it's generally just not very good for black. So another possibility, like if you've been paying attention, you might have this question, which is if we play knight f3, f5, d3, if black now goes for knight to c6, and we play d4, you know, like we do against the classical Dutch, what do we do if black now plays pawn to d6 instead of pawn to e6, like in that classical Dutch game? Well, this position, it's very rare, it hasn't occurred very frequently, but basically it's going to be kind of similar to uh, that classical Dutch game where we played e5. Basically, we're going to play d5 to stop black from playing the pawn to e5, and we can take en passant if we need e2, like if need be. Black will generally jump to e5, and now here we just keep developing... And like it's okay for black to take us if black takes we'll just take with the e pawn so that we can develop this guy more quickly and um if black plays knight to f6 which is the more common move then we can continue with bishop to g5 just to make you know pushing the e pawn less attractive because it would pin the knight also maybe there are some ideas of trying to damage the structure here here although I wouldn't do that unless there's a good reason to, because I personally am an attacking player. I like to keep pieces on the board when possible. But anyway, yeah, this is what we would do if black goes for knight c6 on move 2 instead of knight f6, and uh, then continues with d6 after we play d4. Or right, so, I hope you've been enjoying. On to the main line. So, we are now going to be taking a look at the main line, you know, at what most strong players play against our opening. And thankfully, it doesn't really refute it. We will still be able to get a nice advantage. So, knight to f3, black plays f5, we play d3, and well, they say that imitation is the most sincere form of flattery. So what many strong players will do is they will play d6, we'll continue with e4, and then they will play e5. And, you know, that's, that's pretty funny. You know, just, <laughs> they're like, hey, yeah, I like this d3, e4 stuff, I'm going to do that too. You know, that kind of thing. So in this position, position we're actually still doing fairly well, we still have a decent advantage here. So the best move for white to keep the advantage is knight to c3. And um, uh, basically, we play this move because we need just a little bit more information about uh, black's setup, just a little bit more. There are three main moves here. The most common is knight to f6. In second place is knight to c6, which in my opinion is the best choice. And then the third most common move is pawn to c5, which is kind of interesting and does play a little bit differently. Unfortunately, I don't really have time to cover all three in their own games, so I'm just going to talk about pawn to c5 very briefly. So against pawn to c5, what we do is um, we play pawn to g3 because we're going to put the knight on h4. And we're going to start attacking, like maybe the queen tries coming to h5, all that kind of stuff. And then black might continue with knight to c6. That's the most common move, although against knight to f6, our play is kind of similar. We could then continue with knight to h4, hitting this guy on f5. Black probably does not want to play pawn to g6, because taking back with the pawn would weaken this diagonal near the king quite severely. So black will generally take here, and now here, take back with the pawn, and um, what we're now going to do is we're just going to, you know, develop stuff. We're going to try to put the bishop over here, here, maybe over here, but c4 is very good just because this diagonal is very, very weak, and... Um, Let's see, there aren't, unfortunately, that many games that feature this position, 
but um, white is generally doing quite well here. Like black can try guarding the diagonal with bishop to e6, but then we can continue with knight to f5 because black is kind of discouraged from taking the knights now just because they already moved their bishop once. To move it again, you know, it's not very attractive at this point. Right. And, you know, if black continues with, like, knight to f6, for example, we can go bishop to c4 right now, and then maybe later play like this, play like that, and, like, get quite aggressive here. here. Like, you might kind of figure out from looking at this sideline what our idea is, in the main line lines of, well, the main, main line, I should say, are going to be. So, basically, against knight to f6 and knight to c6, our play is going to be very similar. So, against knight to f6, what we're going to do is we take on f5, black takes back. It looks like we're helping black develop, but there is actually a very good point. And that point is we're going to now play d4, and we're going to try to just blast open the center. And the reason why is because, like the reason why white has a decent advantage here, is because we're not really playing against the Dutch defense anymore. Or like if we go back a little bit here, it's much more like we played an e4, e5 opening, and for whatever reason, black played f5. I've, and generally in the open game, in e4, e5 positions, pawn to f5, you usually don't want to be pushing your f pawn because the position will very often be very open, and pushing the f pawn really weakens your king. Like, there are some exceptions to that, of course. Like, there's things like the uh, Janish Gambit, also known as the Schleeman, you know, which is an aggressive line in the Roy Lopez. And there's also, of course, the King's Gambit as well. Uh, but those generally lead to very double-edged positions. So our idea in this line is that we're not going to be fighting the Dutch. We're going to be treating it like it's an e4, e5 opening, and we're going to get very aggressive. So, basically, e takes f5, bishop takes pawn to d4, and before continuing, thought I should just very briefly introduce the players. So, with uh, the white pieces, we have Grandmaster Mladen Muse. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. He is a Grandmaster from Croatia. Unfortunately, I could not find much more information. And with the black pieces, we have FIDE Master Robert Jester, who um, on his FIDE profile is given the honorifics of uh, both doctor and professor. So I'm not sure if he's just a university professor or if he's also a medical doctor. So, you know, very cool stuff overall. Unfortunately, I could not find a picture for him. And uh, I don't know exactly which tournament this took place at. All I have is just this code here. I tried Googling it and didn't find any results. And anyway, back to the game. So we're playing pawn to d4 now. And basically, we want to just blast everything open. If black now takes, then we'll take back with the knight. And this king is not looking so good over here. This king... You know, it's looking pretty unsafe. So we hit this bishop. If the bishop goes back, we're going to play bishop to c4. And what's really hilarious here, there's actually a really, really funny move for white. If black plays queen to e7 check now, let's see if you can figure out what the best move for white is, the best way to respond to this check. It's, it's a really funny move. So the best move for white in this position is... <laughs> King D2. We're kind of going bomb cloud style, but it's kind of justified here because White's King is actually relatively safe, whereas uh, Black's King, uh oh, he's got all these pieces that are coming after him. So it's actually pretty hilarious here. Like, just look at this advantage. Like, King D2 is an amazing move here, and you know, Black. Black is, black is the one in trouble, so I, I quite like this, but this is not what happened in the game. And um, so basically after d4, 
Or in the game, Black continued with e4, you know, trying to just keep the center closed. That was very logical. Well, because white is getting aggressive. White is kind of going on the attack. So white continued with knight to h4, hitting the bishop. Black plays bishop to g4. And here it's very important that white did not play pawn to f3, because pawn to f3 just throws away a good chunk of the advantage. And it's like, we do not want to be uh, making our own king unsafe. We want to be, you know, hitting this guy because black has played f5 and taken quite a big risk. We don't really want to be taking unnecessary risk ourselves. So bishop to e2 is a much better move. Just developing, hitting this guy and getting ready to take back with tempo, like take back with the queen. So black took, white took back. Back. White is still developing. White is still getting aggressive. We're now hitting this pawn over here. So black responded with pawn to d5. White then continued by developing another piece with bishop to g5 with the threat of possibly taking and then playing either knight takes here or queen to h5 check depending on how black responds. In either case, we're at the very least going to be winning this pawn over here. So black responded with bishop to b4, or reacting to that threat, like getting ready to just take back over here with the queen if need be. So then white continued with very accurate play, queen to b5 check, hitting both the king and this bishop. Black's next move is more or less forced. Forced, as is often the case in very sharp e4 openings, very often a lot of the theory is forced. So white now grabs the pawn on b7. This move is fine. And black countered by grabbing the pawn on d4. And here, the most accurate move for white to play is probably actually just bishop takes knight on f6. Simply because black can't actually take back with the queen. Because then the rook on a8 would hang. And... Uh, like, this is probably the most optimal move order. Like, we're going to eventually transpose to what happened in the game. But this move, move I like doing it here just because it takes away a potential option that uh, black could have. But um, instead, white castled queenside, which is still a fine move. Like, still something white should be doing anyway. Like, getting the king to ooh, a bit of a safer place, hitting this knight, and also getting ready to put some pressure on this guy over here. So black took on c3, doubling white's pawns, white took back, black now played rook to b8, and now here white played bishop takes knight, which again is a good move, but in my opinion it's better to have done it earlier, earlier, because now black does have a very interesting option here of going for rook takes b7, and then after bishop takes d8, eight knight b5. And, you know, this is a little bit murky, like, black would go down a piece, but, um, black's still doing okay, like, white can save their bishop with bishop to g5, then we would have knight takes c3, you know, hitting this rook, and maybe there are ideas of this guy coming to b1 if the rook ever leaves the first rank. Also, the knight happens to be defending this guy as well, so... Now, that's pretty nice, even though the rook's probably not going to take that guy. Well, actually, no, he probably would if he could, because then, you know, this kind of stuff. But uh, in this position, like, white is better, but black is still doing okay. Hey, okay? like, it's still very interesting, but also very, very complicated and very messy just because black has kind of given up a minor piece but winning some pawns in exchange for it. All right, so all that kind of stuff. But this is not what happened in the game. Instead, what happened is after bishop takes f6, instead of going for this rook takes b7 stuff, black just played gf6. White now played queen to a6, just, you know, getting the queen away from where it was being attacked. Also, there are some potential ideas of coming here with check if this knight moves away. So, black went for rook to b6. We have queen to a4 check, hitting both the king and this knight. 
So the knight jumps back. And now here, white continued with pawn to c4. Or so this move is a little bit inaccurate, but at the same time, it's a decent move. Move like in order to keep that very nice plus one advantage that the engine was showing, white does still have to play quite accurately. But, um, like, uh, the move, like, the best move isn't that hard to find or understand. It's just rook h e1. Like, this is, you know, just very scary stuff, threatening to maybe take the pawn on e4, or because this pawn is pinned to the queen and stuff, like, trading the two rooks for the queen might actually make some sense here, especially if you're getting a couple of pawns in addition to it. Like, especially since black's king is fairly unsafe and might be vulnerable to some forks, and black's pawn structure is much worse than white's. Like, if you got rid of these two pawns, then basically every single one of black's pawns would be isolated. So, as a result, black would probably play f5, probably just to keep this guy protected. There probably isn't time to castle, castle at the moment. But white would just take this, this guy over here. here, then black can castle... I thought, and um, uh, let's see, trying to remember the details now. Here, if rook takes pawn, then black can counter by just taking the knight. So, white, white should move their knight, and pawn to d4. Like, basically, things get very messy. This is not what happened in the game, but I thought I should still show it as, basically, uh, this game is one where... Um, a lot of the moves are forcing, so this is kind of all a very critical line. So rook takes f2, rook f1, queen g5, pinning the knight to the king, rook d1, defending the knight, rook takes, queen takes, knight takes pawn, queen f8, check, queen g8. And in this position, there are a number of ways that white can continue. White could trade queens and play out the end game, where, you know, White is probably doing a lot better just because better pawn structure and, you know, White can go after the pawn on e4. But I personally would probably just try to keep the queens on the board just because, in my opinion, White's king is a little bit safer than Black's. Although both kings are, you know, in a fair amount of danger just because, you know, there's this rook over here and this knight, you know, pretty menacing stuff. But none of this is what happened in the game. Instead, back in this position, white made a pretty logical move still, just pawn to c4. Getting ready to go to c5, try to kick this rook away so that the knight can be taken. Black played queen to d6 with some threats of their own, you know, stopping pawn to c5 and also threatening queen f4 check. So we have knight to f5 with the idea that if queen to f4 check, the knight can drop back to e3, you know, stuff like that. That we have queen to b4 now. White decided to trade the queens. Queens, you know, which probably makes sense because otherwise there's ideas of black's queen coming down to one of these two squares. And that's, you know, looking a little scary, especially if black does manage to castle and open up the d file and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, white traded queens. Black took back with the knight. White grabbed this pawn, kind of improving their pawn structure in the process. And also making this guy a little bit weaker. Back to this pawn, getting a passed A pawn out of the deal. White played king to d2, because, you know, this knight took with check. And now here in this position, black made uh, uh, probably the move that uh, did kind of chase, uh, sorry, change the course of the game by a fair amount like it's kind of a pretty serious strategic mistake in my opinion black castled kingside and uh, basically the reason why this move is bad the reason why this move is strategically incorrect is because we're now in an end game and the king doesn't really belong on the king side over here like over here maybe it can defend these pawns on the king side but really in end games you should be trying to play actively and you should be trying to activate your king in generally so the king it belongs more in the center like just moving the king off of the first rank would still improve this rook because the rook probably doesn't want to be on f8 anyway you probably want to move it to a different file so not only 
does uh, Castle and Kingside not really accomplish anything in terms of improving this rook? But it also um, it also actually kind of made Black's position worse. It was a move that uh, uh, worsened the positioning of Black's king. Like Black's king should have just stepped forward, or like maybe play King D7 or something, or maybe just do something else. So anyway, Black castled Kingside. I played rook to a1, hitting the knight, the knight drops back to b4, rook comes to a5, defending this guy while keeping the rook active where it's still looking at this. Black now played rook to d8, hitting this pawn once again. We now have king to c3 with a pretty clever trick. Like, Black can't actually take this pawn. If you want, you can pause the video and... Try to see why black did not now grab this pawn with either their knight or their rook. I will reveal the answer in 3, 2, 1. So basically, if black grabs uh, this with their rook, then it's fairly obvious. We just do this check. And if black grabs with a the knight, then, you know, similar idea. We just take and then do the check just grabbing this guy after the king moves. So that's the reason why black did not take this pawn. So black now played king to f8, which you know, is a little bit interesting because it's like, well, why did you put your king over here if he's now going to be coming back? Anyway, white now played rook to d1. Part of the idea of king to c3 was just to allow this rook to come out. We now have pawn to a6. Engine doesn't like this. Engine prefers knight c6 since that move is still possible as the pawn is, you know, pinned to the rook. Look like uh, a6, you know, wasn't really necessary and knight to c6 would still keep the pawn on a7 defended. But anyway, white now plays rook to d4 and knight to c6 is no longer possible because this rook is now very well defended and it's also being improved a bit it's you know getting ready to take this pawn like if black plays king e8 for whatever reason you can just take with check so black now went for rook db8 8 probably feeling that you know we need to save this knight right like and also that this attack on d5 on a d5 pawn isn't really getting anywhere so black saves her knight White just grabs this free pawn. We have pawn to c6, pawn to d6. This pawn's pretty strong now, pretty annoying. Like, it can still potentially be protected by the c, c pawn, which would make it even more devastating. But now black has to always be watching for this guy possibly promoting. Like, the reason why this guy is fairly strong is not only is he uh, pass pawn on the 6th rank, but um, it's fairly well defended. Like, really, the only thing that can actually attack this pawn now is the knight. Right? It's like, only the knight can really make any threats to capture this. And even the knight would need some backup. So black went for knight to d5 check. White drops back with king to d2. Ooh, because otherwise there might be, you know, some potential... Well, maybe not loss of material, but, you know, rook coming here with check could still be pretty annoying. annoying. And, uh, like, king would be forced to drop back, back anyway, and maybe black might actually be happy to trade rooks. You know, stuff like that. And so, anyway, black now played rook to e8. Black is trying to trade rooks this way. So, white plays pawn to f3. Black now played rook to d8, which is a little bit, uh, is somewhat strange, I guess, trying to just keep this knight um, tied to defending this pawn. And, but I personally feel that the rook was more active when it's, you know, challenging the rook over here. But anyway, white now played rook to c5, which I think is an alright move. I don't really have any problems with this. Is some, sometimes an engine will mark something as an inaccuracy when, uh, you know, when it isn't really all that bad of a move. 
Like, there was a bit of a missed opportunity to just go for pawn to c4 and then try just getting the pawn to c5 where it would support this guy. I like it's pretty interesting line. Rook b2 check. White is fine with sacrificing these pawns over here. And, in fact, it's not really a sacrifice of the pawn because both of these would be the, uh, hanging. So, you know, I take and then take. Take, take over here, take, give a check. I, like, this is all fine for white. Like, we still have this pawn, so white can still try promoting this this guy in order to win one of black's rooks. And then white would be not just up a knight, but also up a rook. And then at that point, white would not actually need any pawns in order to win the game. But uh, anyway, this is not what happened in the game. Instead, we have rook to c5. Yeah, rook to b5, takes, and then black took back with their pawn. The engine doesn't like this. And I do actually somewhat agree, like, black might have taken back with the a pawn just to be able to keep this knight over here. But um, if black took back with this pawn, then, and that would keep this guy a pass pawn, and black might be able to potentially do something with that, not in the future. I'm not sure, but... I think Black was mainly just playing defensively and trying to hold on, on as opposed to going for maybe some aggressive counterplay. And now here in this position, White played a move that I just found to be very, very weird, very strange. White played the move King to C1, which the engine marks with double question marks, but it's not a it's not a losing move, but it is you know just a very strange move. Like, I'm guessing that at this point, both players might have been in time trouble. We're currently at move 34, and generally, um, generally time control is met at move 40. So it's possible that White just made this move just to be very safe. But it's just such a strange move, because as mentioned before, when Black Castle Kingside, White should really be trying to stay active so the engine greatly prefers playing king to d3 like it does look like it's going to be fairly difficult to actually get the king you know into the game this way just because all of these squares are covered but like white will eventually be able to do so so like maybe get up like that or something or maybe move this rook out of the way and then you know come up this way like there are there are a lot of ways for the king to come in whereas going back to c1 is just really weird because it's just unnecessarily slow oh but white probably just played this move to be very safe so black plays rook to e8 8 which um I, here black is probably just trying to trade the rooks because that would make it easier to pick off this pawn over here here, because otherwise this rook does a fairly good job of just cutting off the king, stopping the king from getting to the pawn. White does not want the rook trade in this case. White plays rook to h4, hitting this guy over here. So black played king to g8, defending the pawn. White played rook to g4, check. And in this position, we're on move 36. Black was probably in time trouble. Black made a very, very serious blunder with the move king to h8. And if you want, you can pause the video and try to see how uh, how the game ended. Ended like the engine evaluation is a bit of a hint as to what white now did. So I will reveal the answer in three, two, one. So in this position, the reason why king to h8 is such a terrible, terrible move is because white can play knight to h6. The h-pawn cannot come, like it cannot come forward to give this king some air. Like currently the black king can't move anywhere. He's just stuck. He's stuck in the corner. And white is threatening to play knight to f7 check. And not only that, but this rook has to stay on the back rank because rook to g8 would be mate if the rook wasn't covering that square. There. So, oh, here the only real move for black, which um, 
was the move that was played in the game is rook to f8 and um here white just played pawn to d7 and with just a very simple idea of just uh just a, yeah there's no way to stop mate here it's forced mate in three like you can either play knight f7 check heck rook takes queen rook goes back and then take the rook or you can promote first which i think is actually slightly faster might be one move faster like promote first rook takes and then give if the checkmate like there is just no way to stop this so it was in this position that black now resigned so i hope that you enjoyed that game on to the next one Now for the final game in this video, I thought that I would end with probably the most famous game that occurred with the delayed Lizardson. This one also featured the main line, but this time we're going to be looking at knight to c6 a little. So the game began with knight f3, f5, d3, d6, e4, e5, knight to c3. And previously, we looked at knight to f6. We also looked very briefly at pawn to c5. So in this game, black played knight to c6. And we're going to continue in a very similar manner as before with the move e takes f5. And now if black plays bishop takes f5, then we're just going to continue with uh, pawn to d4. So what's funny is that the best move, according to the engine here, is actually for black to play knight g e7 and try to maybe take back with the knight. Maybe use this bishop for other purposes. And white could continue by playing pawn to g4. Black could play h5. And then, you know, g takes h5. And, you know, this is, this is a pretty interesting position. Like... Objectively, like, white is still doing fine here. White's still doing well, but, um, you know, there's a lot of unexplored territory here. Or, like, it's worth looking into this. But this has rarely ever been played, and there's a very good chance that your opponents will not even know about this really weird and quirky line. And so instead, what's much more likely to happen, which is what happened in the game, is black play bishop takes f5. And we just continue with pawn to d4. And here, pawn to e4, I should mention, is not really so good. Because we could continue with pawn to d5. And if black plays, pawn takes f3. We take over here. And then if takes over here, we take with back with the bishop, getting it into the game and supporting this guy. So that's no good. And if takes over here, then we take with the queen getting the queen into the game, and black's position just has more weaknesses in it, and we're going to keep getting aggressive. We're going to keep putting pressure on black. Like, white is doing quite well here, and it's doing even better over here. Here, So, as a result, after d5, black will probably move their knights, but the problem with moving the knights is we can give this check, if the bishop drops back, we can trade and then just take this pawn. On like that's a reasonable way to continue. Alternatively, uh, if black plays c6, then we take. And if it takes back, we can get very messy here with knight takes over here. Here, removing the defender of this guy. So black more or less has to take the bishop. And then we could continue with queen to d5. And... Uh, Again, white is doing quite well here. There are quite a few weaknesses in black's camp. Yeah, but none of this is what happened in the game. Instead, after the move d4, it's much more common for black to just uh, trade, like to just take this pawn with knight takes d4, take back, takes takes, and then take back with the queen. And, you know, white is just doing pretty well here. So before continuing, I thought that I should um, very briefly introduce the players. So uh, let's see. In this game, White was a 13-year-old. And let's see. Uh, I believe White is also a football fan and a rapper and a model. I'm sure that there 
are great things in this 13-year-old uh, player's future. And uh, Black is uh, Grandmaster Sergei Dolmatov, who, uh, uh, let's see, was a former World Junior Chess Champion, and also just a very decently strong Grandmaster, like a 2600, and uh, also a chess writer and a uh, chess trainer as well. I think he also holds the title of FIDE Senior Trainer, if I recall correctly. And, uh, and yeah, anyway, back to the game. So, in this position here, according to the engine, the best move for black to play is pawn to c6, but this actually looks pretty unpleasant since white can keep playing very actively, playing bishop to f4, threatening the castle queen side, and put even more pressure on the d-pawn over here. If black tries to present, prevent this with bishop takes c2, which is the best move, there's a very cool idea with knight to b5. Basically, if black takes, we take back with check, and there's no nice way to block the check, so, you know, we take black king, black's king for a ride, and then we probably just castle and go for a wild attack, you know, effectively having sacrificed a piece, but, you know, black's development is kind of terrible, so it would be kind of justified, and the king would have lost his castling rights. Alright, and, um, also back in this position... Taking on c2 right away still isn't so good. We can play bishop c4, getting nice and aggressive. Black can try trading the queens away because black is up a pawn. We could drop our queen back. Black can give this check. You know, we can still play a little bit. We would kind of be playing a little bit passively here, but basically we want to get the king to safety. And probably the biggest problem for black here, here is... Um, Black would ideally castle queenside, but black took the pawn on c2, so opening up this file for white is uh, actually not something that helps black, you know, that's kind of material that black could wish, you know, the pawn, black's probably wishing the pawn was still existing, you know, still on c2. So, um, uh, anyway, hey, this is not what happened in the game either. Instead, black played the move knight f6, which is probably just the most intuitive move, probably the least dangerous looking. White continued with bishop to c4, or just developing. Black now played pawn to c6. White went for bishop to g5 in this case, instead of bishop to f4, which I think bishop g5 is justified, you know, pin the knight, you know, put some pressure this way. Black went for pawn to b5. The engine doesn't like this, but Black was just trying to do something because White has lots of, you know, development, lots of play. Like, White has a very strong grip on the center, so Black's trying to strike back in some way. The engine instead prefers trying pawn to h6, but this does really weaken the light squares over here. Black would, White would just drop back with bishop to h4, and then after something like d5, White could actually just castle queenside and basically threaten to fork the king and bishop if, uh, you know, black takes over here. The reason why this wouldn't work before castling queenside is queen to e7 would pin the queen to the king. So, oh, anyway, back in this position after white castles queenside, it's actually really hilarious what the engine says the best move is for black. Like, uh, Basically, by far, the best move for black is king to f7, which, uh, <laughs> if, uh, if the engine's saying that's your best move, then you must be doing something right, because I don't think this is a fun position for black to be playing. But anyway, this is not what happened in the game. Black played pawn to b5, white played bishop to b3, just keeping the bishop on this weak diagonal. And here, black played the most intuitive move, just bishop to e7. The engine prefers, again, pawn to h6. And what's interesting is, in this case, white can go for a queen e3 check, and then if black blocks with something, like, say, black blocks with their queen, if bishop takes, pawn takes, then white can just castle. And now here, black really should trade queens just because black is so far behind in development and black has lots of weaknesses in their position that white can get at. So takes, takes. The problem with this, though, is that um, 
Black is at the very least going to be losing a pawn. Like after bishop to d7, there are probably better moves for white here. But I think just taking the pawn is fine. Like white is still doing quite well on this position. And even though the engine might say that white only has a slight advantage just due to the due to black having the two bishops, I personally would take the pawn, but according to the engine, it is better to first play like pawn to a4 or knight to e4. You know, just keep up the aggression, like don't worry about free pawns or whatever. But anyway, this is not what happened in the game. Instead, after bishop to b3, black played the most intuitive move. Move bishop to e7. White now castled queenside, adding some pressure onto this pawn over here. Here, black played queen to d7, you know, trying to develop. White brought, you know, their rook to e1. And um, in this position, the engine wants black to castle queenside. But the problem with this is that white can play pawn to g4, and this bishop really does not have that many great squares to move to. Like, the bishop can't go to g6 because... Uh-oh. So, after a move like bishop takes g4, which I think is more or less forced, white could go for this. Rook takes e7, queen takes, and then queen takes g4 with check. The knight is pinned to the queen, and white would have the two bishops versus a rook, and black would have no bishops. So, white would have two bishops, and black would have zero bishops. That is not a good situation to be in. Like, white would just be doing fantastic here. here and like, white would already just be crushing. So, as a result, black did not castle queenside. Black instead tried king to d8. Which is still pretty unpleasant. White went for rook takes e7. Black played queen takes e7. White went for queen to f4. Threatening to take this guy with the rook. Rook also threatening the bishop. Uh, black played bishop to d7. And white didn't even take this guy with the rook. White decided to be even nastier. Since if you take with the rook, there is, you know... Like, maybe some stuff here, although no, no, there isn't. <laughs> what am I saying? White, White just continued being aggressive with knight e4, because there are things worth more than just a pawn. And White's going for bigger things. White's going for a kill shot. So, Black played uh, pawn to d5. Five. And here, White took over here. here. And Black can't take back, because this would pin the queen to the king. So, black played pawn to h6. White now played bishop to h4, maintaining, you know, this stuff over here. So, black played pawn to g5. White played queen to d4. Black took. And, actually, no, black did not take. Sorry. In this position, black resigned. And, if you want... You can pause the video and try to see what is the best move for white to now play if black takes on h4. Or like, uh, it's just very devastating. Just a very nasty threat. Very nasty sequence of moves. It was like, this was probably the reason why black immediately resigned. Because black probably saw all this. So I will reveal the answer in 3, 2, 1. So basically, if black were to take white's bishop, white could now play knight takes d5 with way too many threats for black to deal with. Like, the queen is under attack, the rook is under attack, and the knight is threatening to go back to f6 and win the bishop on d7 because it is pinned and all that. And just keep up all of this pressure, keep up this nasty, devastating attack. Like, there is no way for black to really deal with all of this. Yes. Like, if black tries queen to g5 check, white can just block with the pawn, and the queen would still be under attack. Like, the best move according to the engine would be to sacrifice the queen for the knight. And even that, I don't think works so well, because white can actually still 
maybe grab this rook out of the deal if they want. Although, just taking the queen back is probably just more intuitive than that because... Like, yeah, grabbing two rooks is nice, but why not just get rid of the queen? Anyway, I hope that you enjoyed this game. This was a very, very impressive game by the 13-year-old uh, football fan slash rapper slash fashion model. And uh was a very crushing defeat for black because white basically won in 19 moves. Anyway... I'm now just going to do a quick recap of the uh, theory that we've seen in this in the video. So to summarize what we have seen in the video, we're going to play knight f3. Black plays f5. Black is playing the Dutch defense. We play d3. We prepare to play e4. And if Black doesn't know what we're doing. Black will generally play knight to f6. We play e4. And if black really does not know what we're doing, black will take this pawn, thinking that it's just a free pawn. We play bishop to d3. And the only move here that's any good for black is pawn to d5. Then we'll take, take, trade the queens. Get rid of black's castling rights. And then we'll just win the pawn back on e4. And we're going to just... Develop our pieces, castle queenside, bring our other rook to e1, and uh, uh, basically play against black's isolated e-pawn. Like, objectively, this position might, like, the engine might see this position as being about equal, but from a practical standpoint, point, um, white has won every single game where this position has occurred. If instead, back in this position, if black goes for knight to f6, then we play knight to g5 with just a devastating attack. Act with the immediate threat is bishop takes h7. Black's knight always has to be guarding against queen to h5 with check, all that kind of stuff. The engine does not see a good way for black to survive this attack. So that's what happens if black accepts the gambit. But if instead... And black tries stopping uh, upping us if instead black tries playing a stone wall oh, after our d3. Black might try d5 to stop pawn to e4, at which point instead of playing pawn to e4, we'll play pawn to c4. If black takes us, we do not take back because then the queens will see each other. We instead play pawn to d4 and we're basically going to have like a queen's gambit accepted position except with black having placed a pawn on f5 for whatever reason. Sadly, there aren't any games that feature this position, but odds are black probably doesn't want to play this. And um, if black plays pawn to e6, then we're going to take, because if black takes back, it's going to be with their e-pawn. We'll have essentially shattered the stone wall. We now continue with our standard King's Indian play with pawn to g3. Knight to f6, bishop to g2, bishop to d6. These are the general moves that are played when developing your pieces in the stone wall. Castle, castle, and now knight to c3. We're going to get ready to play pawn to e4 and just blast everything open. Open, destroy the solid stone wall central structure. And so that's if in this position, black plays pawn to e6. But black can also try pawn to c6. And I like this idea of playing queen to c2. Just getting the queen off of this file. If black now goes for the full stone wall with pawn to e6. We again continue as normal. Castle to castle. And again we play knight to c3. With the idea of playing pawn to e4. So that's against the stone wall. Oh, if instead black tries going for, uh, let's see, if black tries going for the classical Dutch here with on to e6, then we just advance with on to e5. After knight to d5, we play on to c4. Black can give a check on b4 if they want, but we're happy with this trade. And after the knight moves, we're just going to play on to d4, even if black does not do this trade, we're still probably going to be playing pawn to d4 and just have a very big center. 
this position is going to be kind of like if Black took the Alakin and the French, if Black took the worst aspects of both of those openings and put them together. Like, that's kind of what this position is like. It's just a very good time for White and not so good for Black. So, if instead of playing e6, if instead back over here, Black tries d6, then what we're going to do is we're going to take over here, here, like the main reason why we're doing this, like in both uh, the Leningrad and the Classical Dutch, is we want to stop Black from getting both pawns on e5 and f5. So one way to deal with that is just to take one of the pawns. And so after taking on f5, our d pawns mission has been accomplished. We now play it to d4. In the Leningrad, black will continue with pawn to g6. There are many good ways for white to play against the Leningrad in this line. We could play bishop to c4, but this hasn't been played very much, even though it is a fine move. We looked at bishop to d3, threatening to take on f5 and mess up the pawn structure. If queen to d7, we castle, black will play bishop to g7. And then there are a number of decent moves here. We could play c4 and kind of continue like a standard queen spawn game. We can play knight to c3 just to uh, keep the c4 square vacant so that we could use it for some checks or tactics along this diagonal. We can also play rook e1. Or we could play bishop takes f5 before doing any of these things. Against the Leningrad, there are many great choices for us, but sadly, not that many games games that feature us facing the Leningrad, mainly because Leningrad players know that, uh, you know, they're going to be in trouble. So, on move two, one thing that Black might try is the move knight to c6, and it's important to remember not to play e4 here, because if you do play e4, Black will just play e5, and we're going to kind of end up in a reversed Vienna game, which is not really what we want. We're a bit more ambitious than that. So against knight to c6, we're going to play pawn to d4, because the argument is going to be that knight to c6 is actually kind of a bad tempo, so that the knight essentially kind of provokes or allows us to play pawn to d5 with tempo, Oh, so if black goes for a classical dutch, which we'll just continue with our standard stuff. And then we should not, like if black plays bishop to b4 with check, we should not play knight to c3 because, you know, black can, you know, will double our pawns, at which point the knight on c6 is actually very well placed because it'll go to a5 and apply pressure or maybe even come to the c4 square. So if bishop b4 check, we play pawn to c3, and then pawn to c4 after the bishop goes back to e7. And if bishop to e7 right now, we just play pawn to c4. And now if black plays pawn to d6, we're going to go for pawn to d5, with, the, with part of the idea being that um, we can stop black from getting their desired pawns on e5 and f5 by just taking over here. Black might try... Knight to e5, but we can counter with knight to uh, knight to d4. And remember that black can't take the pawn on c4 yet because we can play queen a4 check, forking the king and the knight. Right? And if black now castles, we can just play queen to c2 to support this pawn that way. And then later we can castle or we can take on e6. You know, we can do a number of things. So that's what to do against uh, the classical Dutch if they go for the clever knight c6 trick. If instead they try d6 because maybe they're a Leningrad player, then this still does not work so well. We just play d5, getting ready to take off a saw if white tries playing e5. And then black generally goes knight to e5 here. We can just keep developing. If black takes over here, we can take back with the e-pawn to make developing our light square bishop easier. And if black goes knight to f6, we can continue with bishop to g5. And overall, white is doing well here. Here, the knight c6 trick, it's only really 
useful for the classical Dutch. It's not so good for black if they're a Leningrad player. Here, that leaves, leaves the final line, which is the main line against the delayed Lizardson, and that is for black to play d6. Here, we'll just continue with e4. That copies us with e5. We now play knight to c3. We kind of just want some more information about black setup, and we know that developing this knight is good. We know that this is the best square for the knight. We don't yet know where we want to put our bishops or other stuff. And you know, there are three main moves here for black. Those moves are c5, knight c6, and knight to f6. So if black now plays pawn to c5, then we're going to play pawn to g3 with the idea of putting the knight on h4. For example, if knight to c6, we go knight to h4, hitting this pawn. takes We take back with this pawn because we want to activate our bishop along this diagonal, potentially. We want that to be an option for us. And then if knight to f6, we can just go bishop to c4, and we're doing quite well. So that's in the c5 line. And if black goes for knight to f6, then we're going to play e takes f5. And after bishop takes f5, we're going to play d4 and treat this as being like a king's pawn game, you know, like an e4, e5 opening. And um, if instead in this position black plays knight to c6, then we're going to try the same thing. E takes f5, bishop takes f5, pawn to d4. And basically in the main line, the only real sideline I see that's actually all that interesting for black, where black might have some chances against us, is if we play e takes f5 and black tries an interesting idea with knight g e7. But we can still try hanging onto this pawn with g4. Black can go pawn to g5, and we can take. And, you know, this is a pretty interesting position, pretty unexplored territory. Or sadly, I don't have any good model games about this position, but White is still doing okay here. here. So anyway, that concludes my little presentation, a little video on the delayed Lizardson. I hope that uh, this helps you in destroying the Dutch defense. And it's like, this is a very, very strong line. And it's one that, as a Dutch defense player myself, I myself find this to be one of the strongest anti-Dutches. Uh, anyway, I hope that you enjoyed. Until next time.